can put away a large pizza by herself. He's allergic to cheese. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. Well, the Masters is supposed to tee off today. Hey, welcome to the show, Maggie Gray, Andrew Perloff. Weather may have something to say about it, Perloff, but beyond that, the number one story going into this tournament is still Tiger Woods. We talked yesterday about Scotty Scheffler's wife going into labor, but that's really a side show for the golf, and, and Tiger really is still the top story for most people. And if you look at Tiger's body of work, over the last few years since his car accident, I really think it's time for him to become a ceremonial golfer and really (laughs) retire from competitive golf. You Ceremonial. Throw off. What are we watching here? We're watching a guy who's withdrawn from three of the last six tournaments he's played in. We're looking at somebody whose body is just physically broken down to the point where just making the cut is now the goal and probably should be the goal, let alone actually winning Mm -hmm. another green jacket or another major. How can you say that? Because would you have said the same thing in 2016, 17? I mean, the guy went a decade without winning a major and came back and won the Masters. What's to stop him from doing that again? He's 48. He's not 68. I get and this it. is a Masters. We, we've seen guys in their 50s qualify all the time, make the cut. Uh, there is, there's no reason for him to turn away from this, especially this tournament. He knows that course so well. He does, but I know you and I will always disagree about this until the end of time. Mm-hmm. It is a rigorous course to walk, to walk. And I know you yeah. have a thing about, oh, 80-year-olds can all play golf. Well, they're not all playing competitive golf. And the thing about Augusta, and I've never been there, but obviously I know mm. enough about the course doing this this long, is that it is rigorous. It can be tricky. You are hitting very odd shots if you're mm-hmm. not perfect on the fairway. And it's hilly. It doesn't come across that way on TV with the azaleas and they chirping in the bird yeah. music, but the bird sounds, but it is very hilly and it is phys- physically demanding. It's a course he once dominated that now is going to be a course that's going to dominate him. No, he he will always he will always get up for this course. Well, I, can, I can't his believe body that. can't can do it anymore. It's not about the mentality. I think yeah. I think his mental will always be I'm the Tiger Woods in my prime. I'm the one who is you know everyone's chasing me. I am the 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 best in the sport, and I understand why you need to have that for a competitor. Mm-hmm. But his body not only has it been breaking down. The car accident I think really took the last part, and that was in 2021. So that's after he won the Masters in 2019. Right. And it shattered his ankle. I mean, he's lucky to be alive, I think. But beyond that, shattered, like, you know, and has now, like, rods and everything around that part of the body. I I just think at this point, it's almost like not – it's almost doing a disservice to how great Mm. of a career that Tiger Woods had. We shouldn't have to watch this ending where he's ranked 969th in the world, where he can't get through a round at the Masters. I mean, to say – he said it himself, he goes, everything has to go right for me to have a chance. And even if everything goes right, are you sure his body's going to hold up for four days? Well, this year it looks pretty bad. I have to be honest, you know, he can't finish a tournament. But you're telling me in he's 48. In the next 10 years, he's not going to at least make a run at the Masters? 10 years? What well, are we I mean, doing? Last year, Fred Couples was 63 and made the cut. And Fred Couples is actually, ironically, the one golfer known to have a worse back than Tiger Woods. <laughs> right. uh, if you know that course, you yeah. can make a make a leap. Old golfer, it's, it's an era of old golfing, by the way. Phil Mickelson set the record uh, winning the PGA at 50. I think there's no reason to think Tiger Woods can't make a, an unexpected run at some point later. So if you're saying ceremonial, that means hang him up. If you're still going to be an active golfer, not on the senior tour, obviously the one place he's going to play first is Augusta. So I, but I would can, not count him still out. Do, he can still do the ceremonial tee off and, yeah. and doing that without having the burden, I think, of being uh, actually in the field and competitively right. golfing when he can barely make the cut. Well, I mean, he's made the cut. Or made the cut, but barely, he can't finish the tournament. I mean, he never misses the cut here. Even if he doesn't make the cut this year because of health, he will make it next year. I mean, what? this is golf. What are we talking about here? It's not like he is limping around. There's How many guys are really forced out because of injury? How many guys are that hurt? It's just not, not a thing. Okay, but there is the ending of legendary careers. Not which, in golf. But they generally don't go great in sports. You they know? go great in golf. Well, I mean, no, but a lot of those guys Nicholas. are doing ceremonial type of stuff. And also, a lot of those guys weren't going for the type of history that Tiger was going for. You know, Fred Couples wasn't going for Jack Nicholas's major record. You know, and, ja- and Fred Couples, 
is not the face of the sport still. See, that's mm. another part of this where we're talking about Tiger Woods. And I think that with the, considering all of his injuries and how far he's fallen, you know, why be competitively golfing right now? You know, why not just... a major. Perloff, that's not happening. It definitely is. No, it is. Oh, my gosh. Tom Watson almost won the British Open at 60. Is, at 60. Did he have anywhere way- the, the injuries the Tigers had? His leg is fused together. His it, back is falling it's apart. It's golf. It's golf. I mean, come on. I, I think that he is a great... By the way, watch the British Open, too, because of weird courses, and some of those the Tiger just loves over there. Yeah. I'm just telling you, for him to, to hang him up would make no sense. Yes, this year could go very badly. He could miss the cut for the first time in over 20 years. Yeah, he's but, going for the record, 24. That would but, be Fred Couples. I, I still think that uh, he, at some point, his body's going to settle down a little bit. He doesn't have to destroy the ball every time. And I think at some point, he's going to figure out how to play with this sort of fused together body. It's golf, Maggie. You really don't think that that he can figure out a way to, to get his body through four rounds of a tournament at some point? And no. all you need is to get to, to strike iron. I mean, he w- did you see him winning the 2019 Masters? Nobody saw that. No, but here's the thing. You're telling me now that he's going to be taking on the Scotty Schefflers? Now, these are people oh, who are on. in their absolute prime. I mean, Scotty Scheffler? Scotty, even with a fused ankle, he's as much as athleticism as Scotty Scheffler. It's not about the athleticism, about who's playing the best golf and who's in their prime and who's far past it. And I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not taking away anything from Tiger or what he did or, you know, his legacy in the sport is cemented. And, he did have that big, you know, win in 2019, and that's now a long time ago. Now that's five years ago. So what's been happening since then? It's been more challenges on his body. Do we have the cut of him talking about the pain that he's in and how much pain Tiger physically deals with at Augusta? Let's hear. Is it worse here? And are you playing with playing with painkillers? Uh, I hurt every day. Yeah. <laughs> Please, so, yes. I, I, I ache. No, I, I ache every day, and um, I, I prefer it warm and humid and hot. And uh, I know we're getting some thunderstorms, so at least it'll be hot. It won't <laughs> be like last year. Okay, he says also that his ankle actually feels good, but everything else is not great. You love and given so much to. Well, the ankle doesn't hurt anymore. It's fused. It's not going anywhere. Um, so that that's fine. Uh, it's other parts of my body that are not have to take the brunt of it. Um, so yeah, once you put the rods in there, it's, it's good to go. Um, but you know, the, the, the back, the knee, then other parts of the body have to take the, the load of it and just the endurance capability of, of walking a long time and being on my feet for a long time. Yeah. I, I mean, what, what are we, ta- what are we doing here? I mean, that you're talking about, you think that miraculously this body that he's given everything to this sport, right? Maybe too much. Maybe he went too hard training with the Navy SEALs and all of that during his career. And maybe it was too much, but he's given his body sacrificed it. There's nothing left there, You know, if it's not going to be the ankle, it's going to be the back. If it's not going to be the back, it's going to be the knee. If it's not one knee, it's going to be the other knee. It, it's just doesn't stop. This is why I would say Wood should just hang it up from competitive golf. He's done everything he can do but with the, this body. The most important part of your body as a golfer is between the ears, Maggie. Yeah. A <laughs> wise man up. once told me yeah. the most what is uh what's that Bobby Jones quote about something about six inches between your ears yep. is all that matters of golf? Honestly, all that being said, if we're in twenty twenty six and Tiger gets hot in Augusta, even if he hangs it up ceremoniously, he'll probably always come back and play Augusta. Sure. Uh, you tell me if it's Sunday and he's three shots off the lead and you're, uh, I, I don't know, you're Victor Hovland, who I picked, by the way, 35 to 1, even though he's slumping, and Tiger Woods is three shots behind you, you're not going to be scared? No, I'm not oh, anymore. Well, you'd be cr- maybe this was you'd 2008. Be I tell you, there is one more run in this dude. Can and he it, get to Sunday? Can he get to Saturday? I mean, honestly, I'll bet you he makes a cut and bails out on Saturday. That seems to be his MO So what now. are we doing now? Like, because, this is the thing. What are we doing? He's still dangerous. He's still had some nice, nice showings. I'm telling you, there's still golf in that guy. Okay, fine. But if they're, if he's really in it now to start breaking some of these records, you know, making the most consecutive Not cuts, you know, and Fred Couples and trying to get a six-screen jacket and trying to, you know, eventually get to Jack Nicklaus and his major titles, then getting to Saturday – that does nothing for you. You might as well be playing a ceremonial round because if you can't finish the tournament, this is Tiger Woods. You know, the bar is so high for him and set so high. If he's not even able to finish a tournament, why are we doing this? Because to do it for just for, you know, a lark, that's not what his legacy is about. His legacy then is already set in stone 
as one of the greatest golfers ever, if not the greatest. Yeah, I think he believes he has another major, maybe two in him. Maybe and two. Honestly, I would watch him over the next five or six years for this tournament and definitely for the British Open. Because, you know, that those those courses are just different. Yeah, and you think he, the if, wind and the swirling wind? Yeah, and the, oh, I just okay. think that, that that can knock out some of the more athletic golfers. I, I'm telling you, Tiger's going to win another major. I'm so confident in this fact. Even though his body is breaking down. Body, because you mentioned, like, it never ends well. Like, name a golf. I mean, it's not common for golfers to really have to retire because of injuries. I mean, most of them just fade, I think. I mean, we're may, watching I mean, a fade. Like, a fade, that's no, the but they thing, fade and mental, it's sad. They fade mentally. It's not like, listen, Tiger's out there. He said the ankle doesn't even hurt anymore. Except the back, the knee. Yeah, but the, every go, every old man on a golf course has back problems. <laughs> yeah, not every <laughs> old man on the golf course is trying to break records. Yeah, but they're playing golf. Yeah, you always say that, yeah. but they're playing golf at a really high level. That's like going to your basketball run on Saturday and being like, yeah. well, you are playing basketball, so that's the same as Joel Embiid. You know yeah, it's Yeah, I mean, Phil Mickelson won the PGA at 50. And yeah. by the way, that does not seem unusual anymore. There are older guys making cuts all over the place. And I don't even know why. I'm not sure why that was the oldest major. What's the big difference between a 55-year-old on the golf course and a 35-year-old? I, because actually, you ironically, refuse big, to acknowledge that there's like a such thing as a golfing prime. Well, honestly, the big thing is putting. Is like The younger guys are more fearless on the greens, and like you lose your putting as you get older. So I, I just think that we are going to be in a golden age of older golfers, too, because fitness has increased. And listen, if Freddie Couples at 64 can go out there and probably maybe make the cut this week. Yeah, but he's not challenging to win the tournament. And that's yeah. why that's the thing about Tiger, and this is why I would say he should hang it up, is because he's not going to be challenging to win this tournament. But that's Fred Couples. He's 100 times worse than Tiger Woods. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I also think that I remember Tom Watson 2009 when he almost won that tournament. Dude was 60. And if you're great in your head, there's always another run. Now, Nicholas won at 46. Yeah. Right. But that was that was a long time ago. Was that 1986? I just think that if he could do that at 46, that there could be another run for Tiger. Because the greats, the, the key thing about Tiger, it's not because he, it is because he hit the ball farther, but it's also his mental makeup is, is insane. He's one of the most competitive human beings ever to walk the earth. So I'm not counting him out. And obviously, the other thing, too, is... You know, ceremonial. Do you think he could stand there and like watch other guys compete? I think that would kill him, even worse than his back. Well, I mean, what's worse? You're going to be, you know, ceremonial and we're not going to have to watch you continue to fade, 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 or you make the cut and you're forced to withdraw on a Saturday. Like, where there's no valor in that, you know, and well, especially not do? somebody who is at the level of where Tiger was and the standard that he holds himself to. What's he going to do every day? Like, what, what does Tiger Woods do if he retires? Okay, every athlete has to face this at some point. And Tiger, at least, can continue to actually play golf. You know, if it's not competitively, he can still go out and enjoy the thing that he loves to do. But every athlete, do you think that Andre Agassi wanted to retire? think Tom Brady wanted to retire? At some point, everyone has to do it. And what did they do the second they retired? Regret it? They went to the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, maybe there's tennis. 855-212-4CBS. Lots of hobbies out there. But... We want to hear oh, from you. Yeah, not not is for this, pro athletes. The one thing they all want to do is go golf. Go gamble. <laughs> uh, this is, I, I'm not advocating that. Uh, is this sad watching Tiger here? Do you wish that he would hang it up, or do you want to continue to watch him try and continue to go out there, even though his body has obviously failing him? And to me, it's just not an ending. That's that that's like the fitting of the career he had to watch him struggle to even get through a tournament. But that's me, 855-212-4CBS. Again, some major rain and wind in the forecast in Augusta, so we keep updated. I think they're going to let the patrons in a little later today is what I'm hearing. But we start with Tiger and you, 855-212-4CBS. Let us know what you think. Tiger, your number one story should even be playing right now. Maggie and Perloff, CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remain.
four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Welcome back, Maggie and Perloff. So I woke up this morning with more Shohei Otani headlines. And Maggie, you can explain the story, but I get this weird feeling. It's a vibe that Shohei is somehow going to avoid this whole thing. And his translator, Ipe, is taking the fall. Not only that, pleading guilty, it looks like, is yeah. the story. Negotiating now with federal authorities. So it's the Homeland Security, it's the IRS, it's the U.S. Attorney's Office in California. And some of the details that came out in yesterday's report from the New York Times, because we were wondering, one of the big questions is, how did Ipe have access to Shohei's bank account? 
So according to the Times, there's some thought that Ipe had set, did have access to Shohei's bank account to steal the money for him to pay off an illegal bookmaker as we go back to the Shohei Otani gambling story. And Ipe had actually um, set the settings on Shohei's bank account so Shohei would not get any alerts when any money was taken out of his account. You know, that happens to me. Like, I spend $5 at the, you know, uh, gas station, and all of a sudden I get an alert, hey, you just spent 5 bucks or whatever. I get that on my credit card, not my bank account. But Right, right, credit yeah. card. So I guess he was, according to this reporting, and maybe this is coming from Ipe, or it could be coming from the agent, yeah. who knows, that he set these alerts and set the settings so that Shohei would have no idea what money's coming in and, more importantly, what money's going out. Now, But that sounds so believable. Like, a lot of people, especially someone like that who's busy training for a baseball season, that is that is easy to believe. It is easy to believe. That's also, like, major. It just adds to the fraud, adds to the lies, adds right. to probably the jail time that Ipe will eventually be serving. And, again, we're talking about Shohei Otani's uh, interpreter, who is pleading guilty, allegedly, uh, recording to reports, for stealing uh, at least $4.5 million from Shohei to cover his gambling debts with an illegal bookmaker. Now, this still doesn't answer the wire transfers detail. The $500,000 wire transfers, which we've talked to multiple people who are in sports and around people with lots and lots of money who say you still need major authentication Mm -hmm. to move that kind of money. And so the fact that Shohei says he has no clue about multiple $500,000 wire transfers, we've still never gotten the answer yeah. on that very important detail. Well, I hope it's in this plea deal that they get to the bottom of that. But it's, to me, it's always been believable that a close advisor rips off a famous person. That is a story as old as time. Yeah. Uh, you know, and this is a close advisor. Usually it's a financial guy who's yeah, embezzling. Agent or something. Yeah, that happens all the time. So I don't know why it's just because he's a translator and he's not a finance person. I don't know why that's not believable. I, from the get-go, I've kind of thought that Shohei's going to get out of this without ruining his career. And here's the question for you. If Ipe is taking the fall, quote-unquote, just really just going down for his guy here, what if he gets a 10-year prison span? That's unbelievable to me that anyone would do that. I would never do that. (laughs) You wouldn't go to jail for 10 years? For for, uh, somebody? It feels like everything I'm reading, this is a very serious prison sentence. So I think what they're trying to do is Ipe is pleading guilty and trying to negotiate. They're obviously trying to negotiate that down, like saying, hey, I'm coming to you. I'm admitting my mistakes. And hopefully that leads to a more lenient sort of sentencing. And he's hoping that maybe they'll take a little bit of mercy on him. It's a great question. Is there still time if that doesn't happen for Ipe to turn on Shohei, if there is something to turn on him about, right? If there is, if Ipe really is taking yeah. the fall or that Shohei really did understand and did covering the gambling debts. Uh, like or the did first Shohei story. make the bets? I mean, Shohei make but the I feel like we're getting further and further away. In fact, I read today's headline. I'm like, wow, he is, he's skating on this whole thing. They get a guilty plea in there and, and Ipe goes to prison for whatever time. I don't think he, Shohei even gets suspended. Oh. You know, are we talking about just nothing now? I think that Major League Baseball stops their investigation. I don't even think baseball goes further with this because, first of all, they want this to go go away like now, uh, yesterday, if they could have. And so if Ipe pleads guilty, they're going to be like, all right, pleading guilty. This is a lot of like the NBA with the Tim Donaghy scandal. You know, they were like, listen, it was just one rogue referee. But what about the calls he was making? La, 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 don't want to know. You know, he was t- oh. on the phone with other referees, and and they did not, I think they did not want to get to the bottom of that. And that was the late David Stern who was presiding over that. I, I think they're taking the same approach. Mm. The moment that Ipe pleads guilty, baseball is going to say, well, well, we have nothing more to do. It clearly was Ipe. Let's, we're all just going to pile everything on this one bad actor. But that's the police's job to get to the bottom of that. And by the way, that was Tim Donaghy's version of these other calls. Tim Donaghy was sure. blaming a lot of other people. I saw that documentary, and I have I could smell a lie from a mile away, and everything in there was lies. Oh, Donaghy's. Yeah. That, Not anyway. a rational. But isn't that the police's job to figure all this out? Why would MLB? I, I always had a problem when NFL would send out their investigation team with absolutely no investigation skills when you actually have the police. <laughs> no, like they, this, it's like former I mean, FBI people. 
Well, I know, but the reality is they don't have subpoena power. It should be the police who are investing. All this stuff is real law stuff. I don't even if if they do a plea deal and this is finished, then MLB probably should pull out their investigation. Well, aren't they looking for two different things? The what do you mean? The police or the feds rather would be looking for did you uh, place bets with this illegal bookmaker? Um, or I guess they'd be looking at yeah, just like what was the relate? No, no, actually, I'm sorry. The feds are gonna be looking at did you steal? Did he steal from Shohei? That's really the big well, they're, thing now. They're originally looking at, did you place these bets? Place, yeah. But for the most part, the bookmaker is the one who's going to get in the most trouble for that, according to California law, not necessarily the person who placed the bets. This is now a fraud case right. where Ipe is stealing. Major League Baseball's investigation should be, should Shohei, did he ever bet on baseball? And what did he know about well, about Mizahara? Because Shohei went out there in that March 25th press conference and said, I had no, Ipe was lying. Everyone was lying to me. Uh, I had no idea, not only about the money, the wire transfers to the bookmaker, yeah. I didn't know Ipe was gambling. Right. And that, to me, was very hard to believe. You spend this much time with somebody, yeah. it never comes up in a casual conversation. Oh, by the way, I lost five grand on uh, Alabama football last night. Um, well, I think the police have to get to the bottom. That's exactly what the police are investigating. That's no. not an MLB. I mean, the police have to know, was Ipe covering for Shohei? Well, I think they're just wondering now, did, was Ipe stealing from Shohei? Right, but if Shohei was actually placing the bets, and I think the police need to know that because that changes the stealing charge, right? If Ipe, if it was really Shohei was uh, having right. Ipe place these bets, and that's not stealing, that's, that's Shohei. Right, right. You're going to send a guy to prison for placing bets? I do think if you have a serious vice, you can hide it, though. If you, this guy is a gambling addict, which $4.5 million does sound like a gambling addict, you can hide that. Yeah. I mean, listen... I, you know, I spent the first year of this show on Crystal Method. You had no idea. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just kidding. Oh but, uh, <laughs> Actually, we did suspect you. We yeah, just yeah. didn't have it in us but, to confront you. But you know people can hide stuff, especially sicknesses. Uh, and if, if he was out there, do you think uh, think Ipe was out there bragging about losing $300,000 that he stole from Shohei? No, but here's the thing. We did know that he was dropping Shohei's name to the bookmaker. Because right? apparently Shohei's interpreter... And the bookmaker met at a poker game in 2021. Right. And so it, he got that line of credit because he knew he was Shohei's and interpreter. A, according to the reporting from the LA Times, and I think ESPN had this too, the bookmaker was going around town bragging that yeah. Shohei Otani, Shohei was one of his clients. Now, said he never met Shohei, but he was trying to, you know, puff himself up and, yeah. and make himself look big, saying that Otani was the client, not the interpreter. Right. But can't you see Ipe sort of manipulating that situation to get this large line of credit. But the police have to get to the bottom of all that. They have to put these guys, you know, in a room, law and order style, and say, you better <laughs> Turn not the lie. lights on? Yeah, I mean, interrogate. Honestly, the other thing, too, is if Ipe is lying about all this, he has to lie under oath and say, and he's doing a plea deal. I don't know I don't know the laws of whether he's under oath at any point. Like, is he going to go into the authorities and just make this whole story up and be full of lies? Because that's illegal, too. Yeah. Very... And I think there's some federal agents here, too. Oh, yeah, I think he has definitely. to they have to tell the truth to them or that's a crime unto itself. So he's just adding on to it. If he really is innocent, if he's lying about all this, then he's going to prison for even longer. Feels a little different than when the guy took the fall for Barry Bonds. You know, remember when Barry oh, Bonds' yeah. trainer... Did that guy what, go to jail? He, he did go to jail. Victor was, Conte? No, 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 uh, no. Greg Robinson, I think. Greg Anderson. Anderson, thank yeah. you. Um, he was he was merely he was obstructing justice. He was just basically saying, "I don't know. I've got no information for you," and he ended up going to prison. You're right. This would be Ipe actively lying on behalf of Shohei Otani, right? This would be right. him having to say, "No, no, no. It was me. It wasn't him. I was the one who was placed. The, I would stole the money out of his account." So I think the simplest <laughs> the simplest answer is that this guy was stealing from Shohei, and I've leaned towards the simple this whole time. You're more of a Sports conspiracy theory well, person. You think it was a fraud? simple about this. The guy changed his story 180 degrees in 24 hours. But he's a if he is this liar and and thief and criminal, then that makes sense. Yeah, convenient though. Was- and also too, he was using that language barrier to his advantage. It's it's believable this guy was ripping him off. I mean, honestly, it happens. I, I'm amazed that this didn't happen earlier. There are so many guys. I mean, you've watched those documentaries. There are so many athletes who get ripped off. There because are. there's so much money, and they don't really have time in the middle of their career to manage all that stuff. No, I get it. We see guys get ripped off all the time. But again, didn't know anything about the gambling habit and did no clue about the $500,000 wire transfers. Very possible. You think? Oh, I, co- Don't you feel like, just let's take our office, for example, yeah. right, where sports betting is, you know, 
I don't say it's encouraged around here, but it's certainly not frowned upon, right? Yeah. We do this for a living. We talk about this a lot. Don't you kind of understand in the office, maybe not how much you, everyone's betting, but you kind of know who's betting and who's not. I know you have no idea. You, you have so? no idea. Oh, but people no talk idea. about it. But it's not uh, about here we do. But hey, it's but not about betting. It's about stealing. him hiding his scheme. Why right. would he sit down and go, oh, man, I just lost 250K on a Washington football game to the guy he's taking money from. <laughs> I just, to fund those bets. I get it, but I just, I, they huh. spend every waking moment together, right? That's what we're told. They drive to the ballpark together. You're at the ballpark. You get there four hours before the game. I mean, you're you're there all day. They're doing everything, every meal, every road trip, everything. It's just these two dudes together, and it never came up that he's, like, watching college football games and may have a little action on it. I, I just, I, you're right. He's but definitely trying to hide it, but he doesn't know he's at a poker game. He doesn't know any of this stuff. Well, I don't know, but Shelly never said I know, you know, he might have thought that Ipe was making small bets or. No, he said poker. I had no idea he was gambling. That's He's, what he said in March 25th. No clue. He said, "Did Shohei say I've never gambled on anything?" He He's, said he had no idea that that Ipe was gambling. Mm, okay, well that sounds a little suspicious. A little suspicious, right? but also, but, <laughs> yeah, definitely. But they could easily there could easily be a five hundred thousand dollar wire transfer. Say the financial guy wanted to move something from the stock market to the bond sure, market. Sure. There's no way Shohei has any idea that's going on. There's I zero th- chance that see, he is following his finances that closely. Right. And that's the thing to me that has to get answered. All the other stuff makes sense. I mean, you could people hide addiction all of the time. Yeah. All of the time. So, like, the fact that you didn't know Ipe was millions of dollars in the whole gambling, that makes sense to me. A one-on-one transaction of one guy stealing from another, that makes sense to me. But, like you said, usually it's the guy that controls the money – that steals the money from the player or the athlete or the you know the actor where's that person in this equation like cuz he pays a third party so right. to speak somebody he's not I, his financial advisor right shohei yeah. can miss things where's the guy who's in charge of the money like there should be a well, third person involved so right. here that's either fired or in on the thing with epe like, that's what I don't understand. You're still. so right about it because Ipe, or Shohei, rather, we're talking about his gambling scandal. Ipe Mizuhara, his interpreter, turns out yesterday, well, he's allegedly, the, the reports are he's pleading guilty uh, to the feds about lying uh, and stealing from Shohei, but also that he had set these certain alerts on Shohei's bank accounts where Shohei wouldn't know when money was coming out of the account. That was the latest update yesterday from the Times. 100% believable, by the way. Totally, except for the $500,000 wire transfers. I think that that's a little different than dinner at the BLT or whatever. But the other thing, too, is Shohei had to feel like now, he must feel like he was living in the Truman Show because he had people who were moving money in and out of his accounts that he wouldn't know. That's bad enough. But not only that, there's more reporting coming out that the agent did know that investigators and reporters were poking around on Shohei. Nobody told him. So all this stuff is going on. This scandal is breaking as he's in South Korea and nobody comes to Shohei and tells him, hey, by the way, there's reporters sniffing around that you might be connected to an illegal bookmaker. I mean, you have to feel like your life is some kind of bizarro game show. How is this going on and nobody can bring it to me and come straight to me and say mm. something is going on? Wouldn't that be a I, little upsetting and off kilter to you? I think you're underestimating the power of, if if Ipe did this, of criminals and guys who do this thing. They're really sneaky. Oh, the agent, though, didn't I mean, the tell guy, anything that's going I, on? How about that guy who stole $22 million of bad bad. Fantasy, daily fantasy for the Jaguars that went on for five years, twenty two million, and they never and they never found out. They never even found out. But the like, Jaguars aren't apt. No, they're not. <laughs> so, this, is, this is happening all over the place. There is embezzlement going on under our very nose. But I think to Maggie's point, <laughs> Wait a though, look at it, Ryan. Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's going Ryan, on? do you have the bank I'm not account? To anything. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but to Maggie's point, though, I mean, like, it, it, yes, Ipe's abilities. Even I may have underestimated. It sounds like. I still have questions about why, okay, he has changed the alerts on your bank account, but Shohei at some point is spending money on things. So do you go and see, hey, I thought I had $6 million. Instead, I have $3 million. Like, what's going on? <laughs> you know so, but whatever. Maybe he, maybe he just doesn't care about that. I do think the question, though, does go back to that third person that Maggie and Pearl and uh, Bogus are talking about, where it's like, how, though, when once you were alerted, hey, there's something going on with Ipe that Shohei doesn't get any contact about that. Like, that just seems like a very weird... Yeah, where's the ask- financial guy? Yeah, it's a well, weird way to move. Now, it, it may just be pure incompetence, but 
this is CAA. These are some of the, the most like competent people in the world when it comes to this stuff. But if you're that CAA, part is a little bit, uh, you're a little CAA bit and you want to get a message to Otani, who are you calling? Ipe. Ipe. I don't. I don't know about that. Why, why well, am I talking, it might why am I talking, be Ipe. It's like nobody. It's his agent. Why am I talking to Ipe? It's like nobody. Uh, also, I don't know. Here's the other part. I know that Ipe and Shohei had this really close relationship, but he's not the only person in the United States who speaks Japanese. Exactly. And or in California, mm. or probably at the CAA offices. CAA is a, by the way, just a major agency. But you don't um, think that Ipe was in a unique position to manipulate everything because he was Shohei's interpreter? Well, I think that's what they definitely yes, and that's also what they want you to think. You, they you want to pin that. this on one guy. He's the bad actor, and it's. A much cleaner if this whole thing is an Ipe, you know, produced scandal. So you, even if he pleads guilty and goes to prison for ten years, you're still never going to believe that it was Ipe, and you're going to think it's a cover up. But you have no evidence that any of that happened. Where we do seem to be getting a lot of evidence that Ipe masterminded the whole thing. I would, I would still like to know about. I, there, I still want the details about the wire transfers. We should move on. Though. Well, the Other police headlines. are obviously going to get that. I mean, that's not going to. Well, you guys the police, pleading guilty, they, they might just want to make it, it go think, away. You know, we're wondering about the wire transfers. You don't think the federal agents are wondering about? This? And they don't give a you know what about Otani, or they're not protecting Major League Baseball. They want their win. If anything, they're probably disappointed they can't put this on Otani. Oh, to get a little bit more uh, publicity? This is not an MLB investigation. These guys love their pictures of the guns and the money and the drugs on tables. Like they want, they want headlines. They want to pick photo ops. Yeah, but they don't also- want to go. Ah, we should throw the Dodgers a bone here and yeah. not and not nail Otani. I don't know. There's definitely a relationship though between the Dodgers and the city. I mean, it, I, I, but this is not the city. Yeah, this I mean, is the federal government. No, it's the feds. I get it. There's a there's. I I do think that there are. How, like, there's a reason why the NFL. I don't know if baseball has this. There's a reason why the NFL has like a political lobbying arm. You know, there's like there you okay, want to know that's not people. the same thing as like the for, feds, for tax it. breaks for stadiums and stuff like that. I totally get it, but it's powerful people in high places who are all connected to each other who have <laughs> a vested interest to keep making money. Right. I mean, I guess so. I, like, yeah, that's convenient. I guess like if you want to like keep these things alive, but this is not MLB going. Hey, we looked into this, and no, did nothing wrong. He's going to keep playing. This is the federal government yeah. deciding that he didn't do anything. Well, not yet. Well, that's what the story says. They're saying that Ipe is going to plead guilty and throw himself in front of the bus. The story says that they have found no, the Times no, says no, they have no, no proof connection. that Otani has bet on sports. There are powerful forces at work here, Matt Bogus. Right. Don't be naive. <laughs> Chuck um, Schumer is yeah, saying you better guys. not <laughs> indict this guy. Listen, you guys, keep your head in the sand as much as you want. Let's get to some more headlines, though. Good morning. Uh, let's do some actual baseball. The game's top prospect made his debut last night at Fenway. 20-year-old Orioles second baseman Jackson Holiday went 0 for 4, 2 Ks, and an RBI ground out. I wasn't very nervous. Um, obviously, my my results weren't what I liked, but I wasn't I wasn't nervous. Um, I felt comfortable on defense, and, and I felt comfortable at the plate. Um, I felt like I took some good swings, and just wasn't able to, to capitalize on on some. Maybe he didn't like his results, but the team result was good. The two two, Westbrook slams this in the inner center field. Duran is back, turning around. That baby is out of here. Wow. That's from Orioles uh-huh. Radio. Uh-huh. Jordan Westberg hurting folks in center field in Fenway. A go-ahead three-run homer, top seven. Baltimore rallying for a 7-5 win over the Red Sox. By the way, 21 for Jackson Holiday. That guy is a beast. Yeah. He's huge. I know. Also, one of my new favorite pastimes is when you tell somebody else that the person is the son of somebody you watched. Mm-hmm. And just watching their face. And that happened with oh, the wait, EJ wait, wait, yesterday. Wait, 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 wait. Jackson Holiday's Matt Holiday's son? Oh, yes. Come on. <laughs> I had no idea. I've been watching these pictures of him coming up and being angry in the dugout because he didn't start at the beginning of the year. Gosh, did not know. Such a great, like, uh. Wait, everybody knew Jackson great, Holiday was Matt Holiday's I, I son? I did not know yesterday. And EJ just like, oh. I just it, found <laughs> out right now on air. You could actually cut that. My face. <laughs> It's a great. You should try nah. it. Try it with a coworker today. Here's my face of how do you not know that? I mean, he's like the most popular. There's no more recruit. The, the always the story is here's Jackson, Matt's son. That's the reason what why I he's said. a beast is because he grew up in a baseball factory <laughs> in Oklahoma where his dad manufactured this stud prospect. And there's another one coming, by the way. But it's funny though. Matt Holiday is one of those players who history forgets a little bit. Like I never think about Matt Holiday. Oh, I don't. He always had big hits against the Mets. Mm-hmm. Is he yeah. a Hall of Famer? No, no. But I don't think so. World Series champ though. Yeah, really good player. Made a lot of money. Mm. And he's just building kids in, in some <laughs> converted barn in Oklahoma. He's building them. You make it feel barn. like he's in like some kind of like lab or some tomb. Oh, yeah. I mean, welcome <laughs> to the world now that you guys know. Like, go look. They they have this huge, on their property, this what should be like a public 
athletic facility of baseball and basketball and football, they, they're like the kid from Little Giants who made it through the crazy dad and got here to the to the majors. So is this looked at so as, you said, a, as a to good the world. thing? <laughs> is this looked at as a good thing, by the way? This Matt Holiday. Yeah, factory? I don't think. Yeah, I know. I don't think there's negative. Like Todd Marinovich. Right. Kind of, it's just the fact like they were born into this, and now there's there's videos of him at like three years old crushing balls at Coors Field. Like that's awesome. He's just been they've been like this since birth, basically. I love. I love. I know we we hate nepotism in most places, and yeah. I, I'm one of those people. But I love the sons and daughters of athletes just being narrowly at the sport. Like I like that will never get old for me. It's just but such it, an advantage. But isn't it funny? It's always the mid level NBA guy who has the great sons, like Dell and and Joe Bryan. But that's why I like this Jackson Holiday. That's why yeah. I love Vlad and Vlad Jr. I love the like yeah. my my dad is a star or a Hall of Famer, and the son is the next one. Like yeah. that something you about know. that story just always resonates with me. And I learned about it yesterday. <laughs> and welcome to the world. <laughs> I learned about it today. Yeah. <laughs> Am I stupid? <laughs> Five minutes, Jackson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Stupid I mean, is not the right word. No. Yeah, You're I mean, definitely not. I don't. Stupid. I don't. Yeah, I don't really follow amateur baseball like you do, Bogus. Apparently, <laughs> no, I don't follow amateur baseball. I follow major league. I mean, he's been a major league story since last year. I mean, he's the number one pick in the draft. Yeah. Yeah. I. Yeah. I. Be honest, missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> I blame Ack for bad updates in the afternoon. No, no, I think Ack was saying it. Ack never does MLB draft. <laughs> I'm going to say, you think Perloff's listening when Axe doing updates? Come on, bogus. <laughs> She's not listening when we're doing the show here. In fact, my bad. Uh, the Milwaukee Bucks will finish the regular season at least without Giannis. No Achilles injury, just a left calf strain. His playoff status is a little bit uncertain as well. It's good news, a little tiny bit of bad news for the Bucks with Giannis in that lower left leg. Calf strains can be tricky. You know, they're the type of thing that can linger, but we'll see. Look at Joel Embiid came back from an injury. He's playing great. It's, is it going to be what happened to Luka Doncic two years ago where he has a calf strain, misses the last week of the season, Brunson carries him for a couple of games, and he returns and goes off in the playoffs, takes the Mavericks to the Western Conference Finals? Or is, I don't want to wish this, and I'm not going to what is it a Kevin Durant situation where right. this is the Just precursor worse. to something worse yeah. because Giannis had Achilles tendonitis earlier this season, and we saw him come up lame in a non-contact in a shoot-around. So this is something that is definitely worth following. I'm nervous about Giannis's future, and Doc may have uh, skated by again because if he have a Giannis that's out, he's going to have another, more excuses to say, well, oh. this isn't my fault. Like, I didn't have Giannis. The Who could have won without Giannis? In. Giannis. This is a non-story. The Bucks were going nowhere with Giannis. This team lost with Giannis scoring 40 to the Wizards. This team was going nowhere with Doc Rivers. Yeah, that's Does the anybody problem. Have, I mean, their their title odds are not good with or without Giannis. So, actually, it's you bring up a good point. This is the best thing that ever happened to Doc, the spin doctor. <laughs> because they were going to get... They had no... I know they beat the Celtics the other day, but they... I don't think they had a chance. Am I being naive? Like, there's no way they were coming out of these. It doesn't... It didn't look good for them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is, I don't know. The East, they they might as well call off that playoffs and just put the Celtics into the finals. And I'm sorry, it was not working with Doc Rivers. I was going to say, I mean, is the Dame Lillard, Dame Lillard trade might go down as maybe one of the worst superstar trades of this generation. I oh, mean, we've got so many better ones have, than that. We have some bad ones, but this was supposed to be putting you over the top as a champion. And what may have happened was they may have put the Celtics over the top of change by trading away their own starting point guard. Like, that, that's a double whammy. Drew, you you yeah. traded for yeah. Lillard, getting rid of Drew Holiday, your He's defense, your heart and soul. The guy just made $150 yeah. million dollars yeah. last, uh, yesterday over four years. And that guy may be the reason why the Celtics get over the hump. Yeah, mistakes were made. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Doc's there. And don't forget, like, the flip side of that, too, is, like, Lillard waited, I thought, too long to leave Portland. Yes. He finally leaves Portland, and this is what he walks into. Well, because he only wanted to go to Miami yeah. and then found himself in Milwaukee <laughs> where they go with the first-time head coach. The vibes are immediately off, and here comes Doc Rivers to the rescue. Mm, this to the thing rescue. was doomed from the jump. <laughs> that is not a formula to, to <laughs> win an NBA title. Uh, thank you, Bogish. Uh, coming up, Russell Wilson, uh, the latest on Russ and questions about his legacy. We'll get to the new Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback in just a moment. Don't move. Maggie and Pearl off CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five-minute break.
4 minutes 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Andrew Perloff. So uh, congrats to Russell Wilson. Not only does he, for now, have the starting job for the Pittsburgh Steelers, 
It's their quarterback. See how long he hangs on to it with Justin Fields <laughs> right behind him. He's also been named Essence Magazine's sexiest man of the moment. Now, I think Ooh. Jalen Hurts may have also uh, been given this uh, distinction. He's on the cover of Essence Magazine, decked out, Get the full photo spread here. He talked about how not only is he excited to play for Mike Tomlin, but sort of his place and part of the legacy he believes he's leave he's leaving on the NFL is the fact that he has been a successful black quarterback, mm-hmm. went to two Super Bowls, and he thinks he's helped pave the way for other great black quarterbacks. And not saying that he's the first one, obviously, and goes back to Doug Williams and Warren Moon and Randall Cunningham and Michael Vick. But he said he believes, here's his quote, for me to be able to go to -to back-to-back Super Bowls and win one of them, I think opened up a lot of doors. Now you see guys like Patrick Mahomes who won it. It's really just us so far, but there's more to come. Uh, The emergence of quarterback, and that's the end quote. And they go on to say the emergence of quarterbacks like Mahomes, Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, and C.J. Stroud, to name a few, is indicative of a new era of football and a glimpse into what the sport is trending towards. Um He says, quote, what I love to see is guys getting drafted early, and that's a lot of teams these days have black quarterbacks playing for them. It's all across the league. It's showing that the National Football League is starting to evolve, change, and break down barriers. I agree with all that, but I'm not quite sure what Russell Wilson's role in this was. I feel like, honestly— Super Bowl-winning quarterback? If you had to do a poll, what what was Russell Wilson's biggest influence as a a successful NFL quarterback? I think it's the short thing. It could be both. I mean, yeah, yeah, and it's also thing. I think when he he fell the third round, it's funny. I think he's arguing that hey, you know, because I fell the third round, I would have gone higher, and guys like me are going higher. There's a couple things. He was a transfer, which I don't think the NFL understood at that time. Now everybody is a transfer sure. because he lost his job to Mike Glennon, stuck around in college forever, and I think that's why he fell. And he was short. Uh, the fact that he he was a black quarterback, it's a little confusing to me because Cam Newton and RG three went in the top three before him, right? And had success, and were those guys more influential? I mean, or, or maybe it doesn't matter because they're all part of the same story. Yeah, but you know, Cam went to a Super Bowl, didn't win it. I mean, listen, he still was a league MVP. Yeah, and RG three the year MVP, was, and, and RG three was rookie of the year. But obviously, his career gets derailed by injuries. I mean, there's definitely something here with Ross. I, I, I think he, I, I think he totally has this as part of his legacy. It'd be impossible for it not to be. Um, I think you, I agree with you though. Also, I think he's done, obviously, of course he's done a lot for black quarterbacks. He has to just by virtue of being black and winning the Super Bowl, And, and obviously all that matters. I also agree with you. I think short quarterbacks is another thing that he has a legacy for. Do you think Baker Mayfield gets taken number one overall or Kyler Murray? If Russell Wilson doesn't have the success he has, I mean, height is a huge thing. We talked about with Bryce Young all last year. I think Russell, I remember him saying that he would never have gotten where he got if it wasn't for Drew Brees. And then people definitely built Russ. See, that's the thing. I'd say Baker Mayfield is more a product of Russell Wilson than say CJ Stroud, but maybe I'm being naive here because there've been a lot of quarterbacks who drafted way higher than Russ. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I, I understand what he's saying. It, it's a really, it's a good story, but it is true that, I mean, you can't ignore the fact that what, how many black quarterbacks are going to be starting in the NFL this year? It's, oh, yeah. It's so much different than it was, say, 30 years ago or even 20 years ago. EJ, I mean, you see a distinction here? It's interesting to me because I think when I, I didn't, I thought, I, I thought it was cool that Russ saw himself in this way. Because I don't think a lot of people think of him as like a trailblazer, but right. he is, you know, but since I guess Doug Williams, the last quarter black quarterback to win a championship before Mahomes obviously just did it. I, I feel like for me, I don't look at necessarily his play style and think that people saw him and said, hey, there are other black quarterbacks who play like Russell Wilson. Let's go get those guys. I agree with Perloff. It was more of the short guys, per se. And some of those guys were black, like Kyler Murray, who went sure. number one, I think because of uh, him in a make Definitely. But I, I look at Russ more in terms of, the idea that a black quarterback can be kind of what you think of in the conventional style of the leader of the locker room, the leader of the franchise, the face of the franchise. Um, you know, when we think of a Lamar Jackson who still gets critiques for being quote unquote too hip hop or not quarterbacky enough, the fact that we do have a Russell Wilson, I think, has allowed teams to feel more comfortable taking a chance on Jordan Love's, Dak Prescott's, um, uh, you know, uh, Patrick Mahomes and realizing that, hey, you can have guys who absolutely can be what you wa- typically see in these quarterbacks. I think Russ definitely did something with that. Interesting. And this photo shoot, Russ is going for it with this Essence oh, photo yeah. shoot. Oh, boy. For coat and all. Got a lot more next.
you're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. He's 
destined to get knocked out by Jake Paul. She's destined to film it. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. Adam Silver coming down hard on the potential betting scandal in his sport. Hey, welcome to the show, Maggie Gray, Andrew Perloff. Uh, Adam Silver yesterday, the commissioner of the NBA, talking about Jonte Murray. He was the member of the Toronto Raptors, Perloff, who you'll remember the story. Two different games where Porter had prop bets that were heavily bet on him where he took himself out of the game. Yes, Jonte Porter. He had prop bets that were the most bet on props of that night yeah. in the NBA. A random player for the Toronto Raptors, who's a two way G League player, all of a sudden people are trying to bet $10,000 and $20,000 on whether or not he's going to hit a three pointer in the game that he took himself out of two different games. One because he said he had an eye issue, the other because he said he had the flu or was feeling sick. Right. So this is obviously a massive scandal. Uh, because this would be a player direct, potentially directly involved in the outcome of these bets and maybe by extension the outcome of the game. Adam Silver said yesterday it's the cardinal sin, uh, what he's accused of in the NBA, and the ultimate extreme option I have, this is a quote, is to ban him from the game. Yeah, no doubt you ban him from the game, right? If if they can catch that he did this, like, it's over, right? He can never step on an NBA court again. Is there is there any other argument? Would anyone say he can come back from that? Nobody was saying that he could come back. But I think that Adam Silver and the other commissioners may not be realizing here is that you can ban Jonte Porter for the rest of time. It doesn't mean that these things are not going to continue to pop up. And to think that, and I hope they understand this, that throwing the book at Porter for what he may have done, you are still setting up the same dynamic, especially in the NBA, and here's why. You have a lot of guys who are making tons of money. There's no reason for someone like Jalen Brown, who's making $350 million, oh, yeah. to ever do anything yeah. with a prop bet. But you will also, while you have the top of the food chain, you will also always have the bottom of the food chain. And John T. Porter, whose brother is Michael Porter Jr. from the Denver Nuggets, who the brother makes a ton of money, but even Porter, if he was doing this for the money... He's making 400000 Really great living for a normal person, but for an NBA star, not so much. So you will always have guys who are at the bottom of the ladder who could be looking to cash in, and you will always have, find people who will put themselves in compromising situations. So, yes, you can ban this dude for life. That's yeah. not going to potentially stop the next scandal from happening. Right, but the that doesn't change the reality that you have to ban him for life. I'm not sure, and I haven't heard everything that Adam Silver said, but clearly, this is the first step, and you have no choice here. I mean, listen, Pete Rose is barred from baseball, and he wasn't actually on the, well, that we know. We never caught him on the field, like, not running out a single. This is incredible. This is a huge transgression. I yeah. mean, everything we've seen in sports gambling, maybe the Temple Owls college basketball scandal is like this, but we haven't really seen or been able to prove that a guy sort of let, let off the gas on the court. That's... Obviously, I agree with that term cardinal sin. That's the one thing that cannot happen. You cannot bet against yourself. You cannot bet against your own team. If that starts to happen, then the entire integrity of the sport, the thread starts to unravel. Yeah, this is no brainer. You got to come down as hard as you can. And I, it's funny, I'm not quite, maybe I'm totally naive here. I'm not quite as worried about the two way guys. One, they don't have as big as an impact of the game as Jalen Brown. And I think th those guys do. Think about their future earnings. I mean, Jonte Porter making four hundred thousand this year. Like that. So the the reality is, he probably could have hung around the NBA and made made that much money for two or three or four years. He was not made these prop bets. They're not that much money. There's no way he was making money anywhere near that off a prop bet uh, that he was throwing for somebody. So I don't think you can make that much money. Maybe if you get in a hole because your own gambling debts, you have to do something like that. But I think if the NBA comes down hard here, I, I just don't see this scandal happening again and again and again. Oh, I do. I I, I, I think that it's going to be whack-a-mole. And it's not going to be like all the time. But, you know, we do see a lot of betting ir irregularities. They get flagged. and Yeah, you see them now more. Right. I, I think that open betting and legal betting makes it easier to find those things. Yeah, in some ways you could say, oh, this is like the system working, but I just don't think it's ever going to eradicate it, right? It's like you will go to jail for committing murder. It doesn't mean that people stop murdering other people. You know, the the like deterrent 
isn't always work to keep someone from making a bad decision. And again, it could be a variety of reasons. Either it's the money. Maybe you're getting blackmailed. Maybe you're, you know, find yourself in a bad situation in debt with some gamblers. You have no idea. And there will always be people who are vulnerable who are ripe for this. And whether it's going to be in the college game, whether it's the men's side or the women's side, which are seeing the gambling exploding on that side, uh, or it's the pros. And, you know, for Adam Silver also comes out yesterday and says at the end of the day, there's nothing more important than the integrity of the competition. And I would say, I think there is something more important. I think it's the money. It's no. the money that these leagues are getting from these gambling companies. I mean, right now, and we're part of it too, so I'm not saying we're not, but it feels like the uh, sports betting industry is almost keeping, it's like propping sports up right now. Yeah. Because you have the sports betting is not just getting into the content or creation, but they're also maybe getting into, you know, they're in bed with every single league right now. Right. I understand what you're saying, but that doesn't make what Adam Silver said untrue. Yeah, they're making a lot of money. The most important thing is the integrity. I think Adam Silver is aware. I mean, look what happened to boxing in the 70s and 80s. All of a sudden, people were wondering, oh, is what I'm watching real? They have to know if there's any question about is this real, the sport loses a lot of viewers really fast. That's how a sport becomes irrelevant. So I think they know that. All that being said, I, and I also think you're right. They do want the money. It's very important. I agree with that propping up thing. It's been huge. Yeah. But they, they have to protect, you know, obviously what you're saying, I, I guess, sounds OK in theory. But the bottom line is they have to come down on Porter. And I think players will notice that. I mean, nobody's going to be stupid enough to have this the biggest prop bet on some, you know, bench player. I think any bench player who does that from now on is an idiot. Yeah, but there are also like people who are trying to pull off these schemes. And we're talking about Adam Silver and coming down hard. He said he has the discretion to come down hard on Jonte Porter, who is a member of the Toronto Raptors. Uh, who it looks like was definitely involved with some prop bets made on him, and it was the unders coming in, yeah. and he took himself off the court. I, I really think that, you know, you could say you have to be, like, stupid to do this, but we've watched it over and over again in football where right. guys are still getting busted for this, uh, whether it's placing bets at the facility, whether it's, you know, placing bets on other sports when they're not supposed to be able to do that at certain times and places, and they're still making those mistakes. And then I have no faith that the people who are trying to place $20,000 on Jonte Porter and whether or not he hit two threes and it came in March, they'll always be idiots who are trying to take advantage of the system and maybe don't realize they're setting off an alarm bell about this irregularity, and they're just trying to cash in. I get the sense that in the NFL, the players are way more aware of the gambling rules than they were two years ago. You don't think that they see what's happening here? Yeah, so and Jamison Williams was suspended for half the year last year. Yeah, last year. You think that guys aren't going to be more careful this year? I, I think they, they understand, even coming to the league, I think they understand this a lot more than they did. Calvin Ridley had no idea what was going on. He's like, ah, I'm going to throw $1,500 of parlays on. Yeah, put first his own all, team in it. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean first on. of all, everyone knows parlays are stupid because you're killing your odds. But that's not the point. I, I think that this is obviously Adam Silver has no choice. Bottom line, Adam Silver's got to get this guy off the court forever if they prove that it's true. And that's what you're going to do. I mean, you described it as whack a mole. That's the only thing they have to do. And what's different? I mean, 15 years ago, there was gambling. I mean, how many basketball scandals have we had? I know. Now I, I think it's, it's actually right easier it. to catch guys. Well, I thought the NBA really got away with how they swept the Tim Donaghy thing under the rug for the most part. I mean, that was a situation that could have toppled the whole sport. And they really got out from under it almost with, like, unscathed. Now, there's another part of, I think, the NBA that we're watching that is also, it's not the betting aspect of it, but in, you're talking about people having confidence in the sport. We talk about this with basketball a lot and also with football. The calls and how they've changed midseason. Well, they, from, they were open about that, though. They said it, but again, this goes to show how much the league can actually manipulate the product on the field because of how they are messaging the referees to call the games. It was only earlier this season that you had games that were 155 to 145 and there was gonna, there was 30 foul calls. Yeah. And yet, two days ago, we have a game between the Bucks and the Celtics where there were two free throws attempted. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that also cuts to the integrity because people think that the referees and the inconsistency with which they re uh, officiate, even with replay and all of that stuff, that they think, 
a bad call is going to screw my team and, by extension, screw my bet. I give NBA full credit. They were totally transparent about that. They came out and said no more James Harden fouls. They out- In the openly, middle of the season. In the middle of the season, That's right around crazy. the All-Star break. They said, listen, we, we don't like the way this is going. I give them, if they're going to admit, that we're, mostly he's just change. The NBA actually came out and said that we are changing the emphasis on offensive foul rules. Thank God, by the way, because yeah. I was so sick. I mean, Jesus. But how hasn't many times it swung I... the other way now where you're calling mm, nothing? And who I, knows what's going to happen I'd, in the playoffs? I'd rather have nothing than Luka Doncic throwing his arms into somebody and getting a foul. That was that was killing the sport. I really think that was killing the sport. James Harden would just eat up the whole 24-second clock and fling himself into someone in two points. Yeah. So I, I think this is a better system than the old system. I just don't think there's this confidence. Like, Adam Silver can say we're going to ban this guy, John T. Uh, Porter. He can say we're going to change the foul calls. I think that there still is I mean, they uh, this, do. this question about confidence, about what are you watching and how is it being manipulated. But at least it's they a- admit when they're wrong. At least they have reports. I mean, the NBA is actually has way more transparency in their officials than the NFL. Okay, that might be true with those end-of-game things, yeah. but it doesn't go back and change the outcome. They just say we got it wrong. Well, we'll see. I mean, if they can, the officials can find a way to advance these Los Angeles Lakers this year, <laughs> then then you <laughs> the know Warriors, it was manipulated. Lakers, yeah. But you got to get AD on the court to do that. I, I'm not sure that the NBA is really in a crisis mode there. Yes, officials have a huge impact. You're absolutely right. But is there any reason to trust them less in the year 2024 than, say, 2015? Well, I think they're honestly doing better. When you're making, when now you're like the health of the league, right? And is also now tied in to the health of the sports books, yeah. then you are ultimately making some kind of compromise. Mm. So. I, I mean, honestly, this was a league in 2000, was it 2004 through 2008? You had Tim Bionicki running wild. There was still tons of betting going on. I think it's honestly, I'm going to be a shill for the FanDuel and DraftKings of the world. At least, you know, they could track John Day Murray over and unders this time. Who knows? John Day Porter. John yeah. Day Porter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So I think that uh, I think it's easier now to catch these guys. I think NBA guys are going to learn from this Jonte Porter s- story. He's the first one to do this. I'm sure other people are like, "Ooh, I should have tried that," but now, now they're not going to. Do you think Adam Silver banning this basically G League two way player is going to actually curtail future betting? I, I just think it's you're going to have these little scandals that are going to pop up, and it's going to be whack a mole. Perloff thinks that uh, this will actually be a deterrent for guys in the future. 855-212-4227. Want to hear from you. Uh, this is this is like the day of conspiracy theories, sports conspiracy theories, not the dangerous ones, the the silly ones. Uh, it's abs- actually not. It's a day of sports conspiracy theories dying. Because, no, no, I've got another one for you. Well, I mean, obviously, I think the Shohei conspiracy kind of went away yesterday. Uh, I think Adam Silver's like, I'm going to put this this conspiracy to rest. You could look at it either way. You could be a, this is whatever the one you're coming up next with. I'm sure there's a simple explanation. <laughs> you be the judge. Got another one for you. Another sports conspiracy. Someone crying foul on an NFL playoff game from years ago. Get you that in just a minute. It's Maggie and Perloff. Don't move. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. minutes 30 seconds remaining (laughs) 
three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Welcome back to Maggie and Perloff. All right, Maggie claims that there's another conspiracy theory out there today that I may or may not buy. I'm curious to hear that. What well, else you got, Maggie? We're going we're gonna to get to that in just a moment because Andrew Bogish has the sound that we need to flesh that one out. He'll be in here in just one minute. Uh, I'm glad that Ryan is here today. He's filling in for Pete um, because did you see, I know Ryan is a big, big fan of the Barbie movie. Yes? Yes. Well, not, well when you say big fan... I'm not like a stan. Like, I'm not going to, I don't, I can't quote it like that. Got it. I, you were wearing a sweatshirt. Oh, yeah. I have, <laughs> I, have, have the, I have the hoodie. Yes. That's what I was thinking of. It says, I am Knuff. Yes. Like, enough, but for Ken. Uh, for Ken and Barbie. And did you see Margot Robbie's next film? Her next project, now that Barbie is done? She's doing something with toys or something. I forgot. Yeah. Another Hasbro, or I guess like another toy company now is getting Margot Robbie involved. It's going to be a movie about the game Monopoly. Hmm. How on earth are they going to make that interesting? <laughs> like Mr. Moneybags? Uh... I don't know, but it's going to be now. This is the new thing, guys. So, like, get ready. This is Mattel who made a Barbie movie to just, like, you know, cro ultimate crossover to gro goose their sales. So now Monopoly, who's owned by Hasbro, they're going to get a movie. They're going to redo Clue. Oh, I love that movie. Shoots and ladders. Where does this end? Uh, Trouble. Guess who? I mean, <laughs> what? we're just going to get a whole summer blockbuster say Scrabble the movie. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Sorry for sorry. It's going to be insane. 
there's a line in the last Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's in the trailer, so I'm not giving it away. A guy, a screenwriter, comes up to Larry and goes, yeah, uh, the Larry David show. He goes, uh, yeah, I'm writing a screenplay based on the Waze app. <laughs> he goes, that sounds exciting, right? And Larry goes, no, that sounds terrible. We have no ideas. It's like yeah. we need to go to Hungry Hungry Hippos the movie because we've got nothing original coming in. So oh, yeah, let's just... all enjoy Monopoly the movie. That sounds terrible. We can't even well, play Monopoly in my family. And I think a lot of families are like this because there's always one person who takes it too far, is a little too competitive. Does this happen to you guys? I, I joined a family. This is So this is one of my in-laws that I will not name. But I joined the family and I was told, if you think we're playing Monopoly around here, think again. We can't play because of X, Y, Z. They're too competitive, when it, and it ruins the evening. It's not. I don't have so much a monopoly issue with someone being in too intense. It's just a marathon. Right. That's the problem for us. Is it takes too long. This is like you know, uh, you know, an August, you know, one p.m. slot at Wednesday for a Mets game, and it's a it's a long game, a four and a half hour affair. That's what it feels like playing monopoly. My family, I have six, so you know, we're doing the full four people. There isn't a like. It's it's just it's not tedious. It's tedious. It's too, it's just too much. We played it a couple of times, and we're like, oh, we're not doing this anymore. So what, what games do you play instead? Well, we're doing a lot more, you know, we'll do a Connect Four. Um, Connect we'll, Four with six people? No, no, we'll oh. just, like, tournament style. <laughs> like, round, round, robin, round Robin style. Come on, like, get, get, keep up with me. I was we're, like, what do you need, t- teams? <laughs> no, Connect no, we do, we do a Connect Four. We'll sometimes do some board games, but I feel like a game like Sorry is usually a lot easier to get through. Um, but the, the Monopoly... It's 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 brutal. What do you Whenever guys I see play, someone bro? pull out the board, I'm like, I'm no. not, I'm not doing it. Uh, I I want to be in one of these Stewart Family Connect Four tournaments. <laughs> that sounds crazy. Is there money My on the youngest line? brother Henry will maul anybody. But I, if He's you're so an good. adult, <laughs> if you're an adult, you can always force a tie and Connect Four. You want to know something actually yeah. funny about that? I didn't think this is this conversation was going to go this way, and I hope she wouldn't mind that I would mention this. She probably won't. But uh, one of my very best friends was dating a guy, and he just wasn't that bright. And they were playing Connect Four. And at one point she was like, do you know the rules? And he was like, I'm the best player in my family. <laughs> like, we got to break up. <laughs> we can't have offspring together. Because, <laughs> like, if you don't know how to play Connect Four, then this is not going to work. Wait, what What rules? <laughs> he, <laughs> one guy <he> goes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Try tic-tac-toe. Is uh, that really maybe they needed to start with tic-tac-toe yeah, and work their way up. Exactly. But um, this, they, they couldn't date anymore because he didn't understand how to play Connect Four. No, and we, he had a couple other things. He wasn't the sharpest knife. Oh, we're big. Um, what's the game? Scategories yes. and Taboo are probably our favorite games. Love Scategories. I, just look out because Margot Robbie is probably going to make them both into a movie. Apples to Apples. Fine. Too. You guys Ooh. ever play Apples to Apples? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're excited. Margot Robbie, <laughs> Half Naked, Scategories, the movie. <laughs> sure. No, <we're, laughs> no. Sounds great to me. <laughs> sounds like a hit. Now, if you go from board game to card game, yeah. now Uno is the GOAT. Honestly, in my head, Uno's having family, a moment among my friends. Yeah. I mean, high school Uno was like you might as well have been playing for the high school basketball team. Like these games <laughs> were that intense. You're talking about slamming your Uno card down in the middle of the table. Wild you know, cards everywhere. You know, you know, some physicality happening, some furniture moving, people not happy with some of the moves people are making. U- Uno is serious. You like, can look in our couch right now, EJ. There are Uno cards hidden all over the house <laughs> from where I was cheating my two kids. <laughs> oh my god! You got draw twos. If, if you don't a... lay off Uno cards in the furniture, you're not trying. I mean, that's <laughs> facts. I, or, or the same. You guys ever play the card game version? Uh, it's called BS. You guys play that game? Oh, it's Uno with cards, where basically it's like, oh, I have three threes. It's a form of basically like. Oh, I think I have. Actually, I think yeah. I played that way back yeah, yeah, in the yeah. day. Yeah, I mean, I uh, you, that's Uno's so ripe for cheating. Did you guys play with two or three decks? We have. Uh, we play with just like th- a stack of three hundred Uno cards. That's fire! I've never done that. <laughs> you, you can't just play with one deck. You why couldn't. not? Well, yeah, it's why not, not enough to get through a big game. You shuffle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, shuffle them up. I don't know. I've never played with more than one deck. I mean, that sounds awesome. What you're, what you're describing, I've never. We done bought that. we bought an Uno deck recently. They usually come in two packs for what that. Do you have very like a, a blackjack shoe that you're dealing out of? The That's... real question though with Uno is: Do you can you stack plus fours? Yes, hundred percent. You stack twos plus fours. Mm. I I, I haven't played not, Uno not in at the same years, time. So I'm not sure. 
Not at the same time. Throw at two plus fours at once? Yeah, no. If someone no. puts a plus four, can someone say, all right, I add a plus four? Oh, yeah. does that match? Yeah. yeah. Then you don't have to take the cards? Right. Yeah, that's eight cards. Now it's plus eight. Next person has plus eight, and someone else has a plus four. Guess what? Oof. They got it now a plus 12. Do you have a plus four? That's... I've seen the Uno This Twitter. is the plot of Uno the movie. I know. I've seen the Uno and <laughs> plot of the Uno movie, plot of a murder scene probably. Right. That's, yeah. the, that's the It movie. leads to a yeah. movie. It's a Clue Uno collab yeah. that Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling Uno, are there do. will be blood. <laughs> and then Uno 2. This is going to be a franchise. <laughs> do you, there is actually Dose. Have you guys seen this? Yes. Yes. Dose I, the I want to play Dose. I've seen, I've seen Dose. <laughs> is it just like Uno? I don't know, but I know it exists. Anyway, Two this times is better. This is what happens when Margot Robbie makes a movie <laughs> about Monopoly, allegedly. So she's the Monopoly woman? She can have a monocle? Or else, what else could she be? The shoe? The top hat? Or is she like Park Place? You're trying to buy her. She's <laughs> well, the best property. Well, oh, I, I don't it's know. It's a little dangerous. The politics of that one. <laughs> <laughs> little I'll do diff- that game, A little then. different message than, say, Barbie <laughs> had. <laughs> you know, the I mean, she's covering all her you bases. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, you We're might gonna go the, the matriarchy, then the patriarch. Pick her up on Vendor <laughs> Avenue, just like you did that woman in the Kimono. <laughs> we actually left her there. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, after the show yesterday, when Bogus told the story about a bachelor party gone wrong because the stripper couldn't get her kimono off, we just go back to the office after this, and Perloff looks at me and goes, did he say kimono? <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely some type of... Asian robe. Inspired. Yeah, that, that didn't help either. Yeah. What does that mean? I Google, Some form of I Asian Google robe. Kimono to know exactly what I thought it was, and yeah. I was right. It's a robe. Yeah, how but do you it's get like stuck in a robe, and it's like a beautiful print. Like it's not. It's not just a robe. It's not. But like how do you get stuck in one? I didn't ask her. Now that would be another thing for a stripper is just like an old bathrobe. <laughs> Here she comes <laughs> with the slippers on. Yeah, the cigarette dangling out of her. Yeah. <laughs> Rollers in the hair. All right, That's guys, who's ready to look. party? Yeah. Where's the where's the bachelor? <laughs> well, honestly, where's, the, a, where's the groom? <laughs> a Wednesday in October in Atlantic City. I'm sure that has happened more than once. So, <laughs> kimono caught. And, um, <laughs> so the game Monopoly, by the way, a lot of that is set in Atlantic City. Yeah, right? yeah. Definitely. Or is the whole game? The whole, whole thing is. Well, Park yeah. Avenue is Park Avenue in New York City, though. Right? No, but they call it Park Place. It's Park different. Place and yeah. Broadway. Yeah, I don't There's think no Broadway Monopoly. Yeah, it's right next to Park Place, isn't it? <laughs> no, Boardwalk. Boardwalk. Oh, okay. <sighs> <laughs> Whatever. There's no Broadway. He's what? gonna learn a lot from the movie. <laughs> That's why we, we need to have a movie. Clearly, this is why. <laughs> just like everything you live is like a misfit version. You have a, <laughs> a bad foot. You should go to a doctor with a weird hot tub. You're playing Park Boardwalk, Avenue whatever. and Broadway. <laughs> He's Monopoly. also playing Dose instead of Uno. <laughs> Hide the cards everywhere. Sorry, I have a memory. Oh, I'm sorry. Why did you tell me every every state then? If you're such an expert, every state, uh, every state, all every 50 road. of them. Yeah, you know, I just know that. All of the boars, Atlantic City, it was that, not with Manhattan oh, okay. Street sprinkled in. So Park Place is a place in Atlantic City. I actually yeah. did not know that. Sorry. Dilbo saying Velcro stripper's best friend. He's right about that. Yeah, definitely. zippers, yeah. Velcro. The pros know about Velcro. She was new. <laughs> yeah, she still had snaps and buttons. Yeah, <laughs> she's still like putting in her hours. Like she's uh, getting to be a therapist she's an or apprentice, something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got three thousand hours. I got to put into this. <laughs> then I get certified. Uh, headlines. We yeah. promised a sports conspiracy theory, Bogish, and I think you have it for this us. This one is a doozy. It certainly feels often that the universe doesn't like the Chargers. Maybe one time their own offensive coordinator didn't like them either. Cam Cameron ran their offense back in 2006 when San Diego went 14-2, and but then they lost a divisional playoff game at home to the Patriots. This is now LaDainian Tomlinson in present times on the Pivot podcast, which is co-hosted by former Dolphin linebacker Channing Crowder. What what job did he get right after we lost? He came and be my head coach, and that is terrible. <laughs> so in my mind, did we just throw the game for a head coaching job? So LT thinks Cam Cameron called a bad playoff game on purpose so the Chargers would lose and he could then interview sooner for head coaching jobs, leading him to Miami. Specifically, LT says the Chargers should have run the ball more to protect an 11-point lead, but Cameron didn't call his number. We have all had a chance to think about this stuff, process it, and the fact that, you know, someone gets it right after we lose. Guys, I appreciate everything. You know, you guys play hard for me. I'm going to take this Miami job. 
What? Yeah, what? I, I, I don't know, guys. This has zero legs. He was a bad head coach. Guys get jobs. Like, teams wait for guys that they want to hire who are coordinators, who are advancing right. in the postseason. But maybe he was worried that it was between maybe him and somebody else, and somebody else was going to get the job. Now, I know I'm prone to kind of believing these kinds of things, um, but... I do think, not that maybe he would throw the game, but I do think the goal is to become a head coach. And the hiring is so messed up when it comes to the NFL. Now, they're trying to change some of those rules now. But the hiring is really messed up where it creates a sort of urgency to get out of the playoffs almost just so you can get the job, right? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I, yeah, how many times do we see teams just wait on the guy to finish whatever they're doing so right. that they can become the head coach? I, I mean, listen, everyone knows the best the way. The Dolphins, they're not making these great decisions all the time. They make dumb decisions all the right. time. Cameron went 1 in 15 for them, yeah. so they fired him for one year. He's just a bad coach. Oh, no, I this, think the best way to get a job is to have an epic failure in a playoff game. I mean, what are you talking about here? You're saying, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. It goes against logic that the guy would screw up on purpose to get a job. The other thing, too, though, is this problem, and we'll talk about it next hour with another NFL player with a conspiracy theory, but there's a problem with these podcasts where guys go on there and they talk this talk and they don't back up their stuff with facts because, okay, yes, they were up double digits in this game. But guess what? The Patriots scored a touchdown to go to keep the game a four point game going to half, and now you're fourteen ten going into the second half. The Patriots get the ball back first and score. And like, it's Tom Brady on the right, other side of like the game. This idea that oh they, they were up twelve points in the fourth quarter and we're just throwing the ball over the place is just not the case. It was you had a a momentary yeah momentarily eleven point lead for a short bit of time. They scored right before halftime. You go into halftime with a four point lead. That is not hey we sit on the ball for two quarters with Tom Brady on the other side and we don't throw the ball anymore. That doesn't make that doesn't make any sense. But these guys they 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 probably have these stories and 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 they they they're missing key facts and key moments in these games that that add context to it. I I think what he's talking about is just going back to the game log here. Is it's tied twenty one twenty one with four minutes and thirty seconds left in the game, and Ladanian Tomlinson got one carry. Now, he had scored a touchdown to the second half already, so you know that the run was working, and he gets one carry on a first and 10 where he gets a five-yard gain, and from what I can see, he does not get the ball uh, again. That's four-minute drill, though. The idea that you go away from your running back, you start trying to move the ball down the field is not crazy. Okay, but you had plenty of time there where he's getting five yards a carry. That's pretty good, and you have four and a half minutes left. Yeah, but th- this could be sh- pure incompetence. That's probably more right. likely maybe explanation. Just made, maybe just made a poor decision. But I, I, I also, to me, I, again, I don't see the scenario in this game where it was like, oh, it's very obvious that they made some insane gaffe and not giving Danny Thompson the ball. The idea that you're up 11 points for uh, literally two minutes in the first half and then the Patriots cut it to four does not mean you're in a game where you can salt the game away. No, they weren't as, salting the game away, but they did go away from the Hall of Famer on the team. Right. Yeah, Which has happened in, it happened a every games. playoff a million times. I mean, welcome Kyle Shanahan. Obviously, went away from the run. Everybody goes away from the run under pressure. That's what good <laughs> offensive coordinators do. And that's why they <laughs> that's always bad lose. offensive coordinators. That, no, I'm saying they always blow it. Like, that's the story is all like, the time. Here's the, here's the thing. Like, good teams actually get the ball back with four minutes and 30 seconds left in the fourth quarter in a tie game, and they salt the game away. Yeah, Especially but when you against, have LaDainian Tomlinson. Yeah, but if you're going against Bill Belichick, that is easier said than okay, done. Okay, but you don't give the ball back to Tom freaking Brady. I'm just saying, uh, yes, it was a mistake, but did, did this idea that he lost on purpose to get into the coaching interviews, that's crazy. And they only had I mean, they only had three plays. So you run yeah. the ball on first down. Okay, now you're second and five. You throw, you're incomplete. Third and five, am I running the ball on Danny Thomas on third and five in my own territory? Probably not. Well, in this day and age, you probably would. Maybe, but this Four is downs. 2006. That's what I'm saying. Like I feel like Danny Thomas is taking 2024 energy and kind of skewed facts of what happened and making up – an insane story. And I, I, Cam Cameron was awful. He was one of the worst coaches I've ever seen. <laughs> I have no reason to defend that guy. But he, he he tanked the game because he didn't run the ball more when they were only up four points or when they're in a four-minute drill? In a three-and-out drive? What's he talking about? Well, I, uh, it is – I get it. It does. Uh, it is a little weird, though, to go away from Ladadian Tomlinson in that moment. But anyway, I digress. Oh, my God. I'd like to see you say that in theory, but if you're an offensive coordinator in the playoffs, 
you are have a lot of pressure to throw the ball. The okay, the then game. why on a got to have it everything play third and five? Am I going Philip Rivers to Eric Parker? I mean, obviously, when, and you're got to have it, it play. You third and five. There is not a coach in the NFL of all thirty two is not going to a pass play. Not no, no, you go to a pass play. You go to Vincent Jackson. But that's well, my point, I mean, though. He's a terrible he coach. Double teamed. <laughs> he might <laughs> listen. You can't obviously. And they were coming out of a timeout. Every coach puckers up and goes to the pass in that situation. It's just what coaches do. You can't. You can't well, maybe hand the ball go, off at third and five and get stuffed. Well, then maybe don't go idiot. to the guy who's being defended by Asante Samuel, who broke up the pass. <laughs> the guy's freaking awesome. That guy's pretty good. Probably one of the top five best players on the field yeah. that day. But that's also not Cam Cameron's decision. I don't think the play was for Eric Parker. That's yeah. just yeah. who Phillip Rivers. Phillip Rivers threw it to. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're talking about Phil Rivers, who's always chokes in the playoffs, and Cam Cameron, and North Turner. And we're saying, oh, how, how do we blow 11-point lead to the Patriots? <laughs> Maybe someone threw the game. No, how about you were playing with losers? Yeah. <laughs> how about that? Is that possible? <laughs> Phil Rivers mean, never won, went to Super Bowl. Cam Cameron, worst coach I've ever seen in the NFL. North Turner, terrible NFL head coach. And you don't know why you lost to Bill Belichick and Tom Brady? Should have gone to Tomlinson. Can I also throw in that is 18 years later? Maybe bring this up before now. <laughs> He's been holding on to it. It's an old grudge. Like, I like was that. he waiting on research? Like, what was going on? I just love that Maggie's litigating Philip Rivers' choice of targets on the play. <laughs> a play that, by the way, you probably are not even watching the play. Who knows? I'm just he going might have been wide play. open. Yeah. Uh, well, Asante like, Samuel broke it up, so he definitely, he definitely wasn't open if Asante Samuel was there. I mean, come on. Uh, if, if I, first of all, why would Asante Samuel be on Eric Parker anyway? That doesn't even make sense. Who knows what happened on this crazy play? I understand. Play. As soon as those chairs come up, come through and those podcast mics come up and those cameras Oh, yeah, you got to say stuff. You're going to just – you're going to hear the wildest stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, This just, is how they really think. I, I think this is how players really think. You, you think LaDainian well, Tomlinson sat down and was like, hmm, I got to give the pivot something really good here. No, he's been thinking about this for a long time. I see I see brothers sitting across from Joy Taylor and just say the wildest stuff you've ever – you've never heard before. For. And I'm like, where is this coming from? You see these guys go on Club Shay Shay. We're going to talk about it now. I say stuff. And I'm like, this stuff is very verifiably false. Like, what are you guys <laughs> actually talking about? We have history. And well, there's never pushback. Just by the way, in this game, 23 carries, 123 yards, two touchdowns. He was on fire in this game. He's a monster. Yeah. He's one. He's the best running back I've ever seen. Yeah. I've ever seen. I, never, yeah. I didn't watch Barry Sanders. Uh I think also Channing Crowder, he ups the level of things you got to say, too. Why? Because he's a nudist? Yeah. Once you throw that out there. Like, <laughs> I'm like you in Carl off brain. It. I knew where he was going with that. <laughs> but no, I also think, like, which, was, he new was Channing the Crowder there for this one? Is he still on Hopefully that? Hopefully not. Or is he a different podcast? No, no that was his a, voice in there yeah, about how terrible Channing, I mean, Cam Cameron was. Always like he he totally brings it with something crazy every podcast. So you got it. <laughs> you got to up your game. You think trying, Danny Town's trying to impress Channing yes. Crowder. Yes. Interesting. Absolutely. And I agree about if you're in that chair across from Shannon Sharp, now that after Cat Williams, you got to say something. Otherwise, oh, yeah. what are you doing? This there? is the Oprah effect. It's yeah, like, yeah. was what, Oprah what are you really doing a great there? interviewer, or were people just like so on their game? Yeah, it's like Howard, Howard Stern. Stern yeah. You bring up the, the dirtiest things that you would never tell any other interviewer. I think that's exactly what's going on. But okay, Maggie, I know you like sports conspiracy. This is maybe the dumbest one I've ever heard. <laughs> Cam so Cameron weird. blew the game. It's just dumb enough to work. <laughs> I mean, the guy's name is Cam Cameron. He just makes dumb decisions. He wouldn't Cam- be smart enough. His to parents throw a named game. him Cameron. Right. Cameron. Cameron. I mean, the genetics were not there. <laughs> you think oh, Cam Cameron? Did, you think Cam Cameron thought there was any chance in the world that he'd be brought up in a podcast in 2024? <laughs> he probably sitting at home thinking like, what? What? What's go- he's probably fishing somewhere. Where is Cam? He's probably- Wait, by the way, did North Doing- Turner not call plays for that team? No, Norv came in after Later. this. Oh, North. Yeah, was this Marty Schottenheimer? Whoever. Was- oh, Schottenheimer was still the coach, loser, but you kept talking about some coach. Marty Schottenheimer won a ton of games, but someone who didn't form the playoffs. It was uh, some perform non-performer. So North playoffs. was still in Dallas. This was not North. Not North yet. Yeah. I, it looks to me like oh, North came in after Cam Cameron. So Cam, first of all, Cam Cameron's. First name is actually Malcolm. His parents didn't name him Cameron. <laughs> That's actually Cameron. worse than Cameron Cameron. It's Malcolm Cameron, <laughs> and you got a nickname like uh, everybody around here. Um, and it looks like he's got some kind of consulting firm. Well, they might be getting some phone calls today. Probably sitting in some ivory tower office, not thinking he's going to hear anything, and he's got to answer questions now. But whether or not he threw a playoff game from twenty years ago. But I, I will find lost Bill any former running back, they always have a grudge that they were not handed the ball in a key moment. That's what running backs right. kind of do, right? That's their thing. 
How many times does LaShawn McCoy complain? I don't know. That's just like <laughs> what you do if you're a former running back. Say, man, if they just handed me the ball, we would have won. And, and every game ends with this conversation. Either you ran it too much or you threw it too much. Like every game has this thread in it. Every important game, too. I know. I mean, every- we just did it with the Ravens. Why didn't they run Lamar Jackson more? It's the, it's, there's always something That's like this. That's true. Everyone does know, though, you can't give the ball back to Tom Brady. And you did. You knew that in, two, what year was this, 2008? You knew that no, in six. 2000. Sorry, 2006. Even 2006. Still knew it know. then, too. Yeah. Knew yeah. it then. Can't give the ball back to him. But yeah. under a pressure situation, everyone knows you have to pass. Because if you, if you throw, <laughs> if you run the ball on the third and five, for example, and like you're like, oh, that's the worst. I, I don't think that's even an option. Obviously, I think Kyle Shanahan is the number one culprit all time of this, right? Not handing the ball off in the Super Bowl. Isn't that the worst case that we ever have? Yes. Atlanta, yeah, when they definitely. had a 10-point lead in the fourth, in the fourth I mean, quarter. Definitely. Yeah, so... Oh, you're talking about the Falcons. I thought you were talking yeah. about with the first time around with the, the 49ers. Yeah, no, I'm just saying that. Obviously, I think a lot of great offensive coordinators have made the mistake because there's nothing worse. If you're a fan of a team and it's a key play and you hand the ball and the guy gets stuffed, that's just the most deflating thing. So I, I get it. LT, stop. You just got to stop. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Do we have time for maybe one more quick headline? Uh, yeah, the big one this morning. Shohei Otani's former interpreter is reportedly working on a plea deal, federal charges for stealing millions from Otani. ESPN says the investigation supports Otani's claims that he is just a victim of Ipe Mizuhara. The New York Times says Mizuhara might have stolen more than the $4.5 million dollars we had been hearing. Guys, back to you. Doesn't it make you want to go to your settings on your bank account? I just wonder, because some, uh, Pro Loss, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sometimes I get the alert, but maybe it's just the credit card on the debit card or whatever. I might not get the alert. I Yeah, I mean, I have a credit card alert. I don't really have much money in my bank account. <laughs> I don't know if you guys are like me. <laughs> you don't walk around with a lot of... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But here, like... here's the other part. Does, ever, does this ever happen where if you have a joint account with your significant other and then a charge comes through and it's something they bought. So this has happened before my husband, I hope he's not listening, but like there's been times when he's bought me gifts and it will be from the Ooh, joint account. That's a bad move by your husband. No, but I never just like, thought about that. It's like, you know, so my birthday and yeah. mother's day are very, very close. And so like all of a sudden the flower like oh, charges will start coming so up. <laughs> oh, that he doesn't, sucks. It, no, he's doing the nice thing and getting me the flowers. Obviously he doesn't know that I'm seeing the alert. Sorry, honey. Do, so okay. do, you, do you do you know sell or do you sell it rather? And you're like, oh my god, this is the who could have thought I was just gonna get flowers today? <laughs> I come in and it's like Oprah gave me a car. I'm like my head explodes. Yeah. Um, uh, after all these years, I don't react that way to flowers, but I love I love getting flowers to my husband, so I always like it. But by the way, you your husband is a very smart man. I've yeah. met him many times. Now, he does not know that the alerts are going to you, and you saying that Shohei is on top of everything? <laughs> I'm telling you, people do not watch their money, especially those guys, as much as you think. My husband, the Ivy League-educated engineer, yeah, he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't know that know. the charge he's, is he's coming to me. He's stupidly buying flowers? Like, come on, dude. <laughs> and you think Shohei is 500000 Shohei, How much is Shohei worth? And much more than your husband. <laughs> well, we, that's uh, up to you. My husband hit cleanup for the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> if my husband is 700 million somewhere and deferred it for the next 10 years, I would get you would very not suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said you were going to like, divorce. I thought you were going to be like, this is over. No, if my husband signed a $700 million contract and was like, but I'm deferring it for 10 years, I'd be like, wait a minute. What? Yeah. What's up your sleeve? <laughs> or what What's happening that, in 10 years? Am I out of the picture? What if you look at the phone and there's a purchase for a $700,000 Lamborghini or something? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, yeah. You're, have you really been uh, yeah, hiding <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars? This is like when the bank is like, is this you? <laughs> Who oh. bought a $350,000 car? No. Yeah, my wife is like, I can't believe you went out there and bought the 2018 Honda Accord. <laughs> <laughs> Under my nose. How dare you get a hybrid? <laughs> Thank you, Bogish. 855-212-4227. All right, lots more to do here. We'll put the conspiracy theories to rest if we turn our attention to the NFL draft. Is one team in the market for a quarterback that we weren't expecting? Get to that next. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining.
four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Maggie Gray, Andrew Perloff. All right, let's get to our Cowboy Quickie for today. And this portion of the show is brought to you by Wesley Financial. Stuck in a timeshare and want out? Contact Wesley Financial Group now and get a free timeshare exit information kit at wesleyfinancialgroup.com. Cowboy Quickie today. Adam Schefter reporting Cowboys are in the market for a quarterback, could be one of the early rounds. So we're talking about maybe a first round, maybe a second round. 
pick for the Dallas Cowboys for a QB. To me, first round has got to be off the table here. You're going into the final year, maybe with Dak Prescott, maybe with Mike McCarthy. You've got, you know, issues all around with who you paying. This feels like an all-in kind of year. I know Jerry said that, and then the offseason <laughs> yeah. didn't back it up. But once the games start, this is obviously a team that's a playoff contender and fancies themselves a Super Bowl contender. And don't worry, Jerry's message will pivot to Super Bowl as soon as we start getting towards training camp. To take a quarterback in the first round does not help you in any way. That's a future move. I don't think the Cowboys will do it. Well, what about this year has said all in? Nothing, right? The exact opposite. Every move they've made has said not all in. Uh, we're thinking about the future. I, I think if they're not going to resign Dak, what's the plan next year? Is it Trey Lance? Is their viable backup? Uh, or is it this great quarterback draft? This is an, arguably an all-time quarterback draft. I think you're going to have six productive quarterbacks out of here. So, And I bet next year there's one first-round pick. So you got to... Do it this year, and 24 is a good spot. 48 or whatever the next round. Actually, I'm helping with the math here. What's the second round pick? That's a great spot. Spencer Rattler in the second round. Heck yeah. I think the I think they're taking a quarterback in the first two rounds. That's your Cowboy Quickie for today. And <laughs> the other option is they love Trey Lance. Uh, but Trey Lance, you're going to have to pay soon, so that's tricky too. I mean, you have the same – you're not going to go from Dak Prescott to Trey Lance and then give Trey Lance $90 million. So – I think it makes perfect sense here. Otherwise, what are you drafting at 24? They need linebackers, and what do they need? You don't take they a need, linebacker at 24. You need offensive line. You need linebacker. You need wide receiver. You could go, I don't know if you'd go running back in the first round is becoming well, a little bit more in vogue. I know yeah, people don't love it, but, the, you know. This year, there's no running backs. That's not even an option. Yeah, no, I think this is a great time for them to, this is a perfect investment, right? I mean, if you're looking at the salary cap, if but don't Dak you want is a gone, you want a cheap quarterback. I get it, but don't you want a body who's going to help you win games this year? I mean, mm. I thought that Aaron Rodgers had a right to get upset about Jordan Love, the pick from three years ago, four years ago. Yeah, it worked out great, though. Well, now, but it didn't, and he won MVPs and had this huge chip on his shoulder, but you're not you're telling me that the Green Bay Packers couldn't have used a wide receiver there? They couldn't have used something else? I mean... Yeah, I'm telling you that right now, that was a very smart pick. Well... Because you're looking at it from four years later, what if they right. take? What if they had taken somebody who could have been a difference maker, and they're actually two times Super Bowl champs with Aaron Rodgers? I saw them. You were draft, so close. Uh, because I don't think the 28th pick or wherever they were picking is going to push you over for Super Bowl. Young players really don't make that much of an impact anyway. I mean, not always true. But sometimes, especially but, receivers can come in and have yeah. a big impact in the rookie I mean, season. Yeah, who was the best receiver last year? Puka Nakua. He was a fifth rounder. So I just think that it's not, I, I, there's not guaranteed to take somebody in the 20s who's going to make an immediate Super Bowl impact. Remember, half the first round is going to be busts. I just understand, I think invest in quarterback is a generally a sound theory. This and is you like get they should have already certainty. done. <laughs> like yeah. they did. Now it's like you're, okay, now you've got to take a quarterback maybe because you feel like you need to because you're out of options uh, because Dak Prescott has you and in in, has leverage over you in a contract negotiation. That's that true, but let me ask you this. I think this is our big difference. I think this is a rare quarterback class, and maybe I say that every year, but I feel like this this is it. This is the time to go. I mean, you watch college football. Are there really that many guys like Cale Williams and Jaden Daniels and yeah, Michael Penix and Bo Nix coming up? I think next year it's going to be a cupboard. It's going to be bare. Well, it's going to be more like the Kenny Pickett draft. You're not going to be able to get your hands on Caleb, Jaden, or Drake May, or even J.J. McCarthy if the mock drafts are correct. So now you're looking at Michael Penix or a Bo Nix. Right. These Dude. guys have second and third round grades on them. They're not exactly, they might not be ready to go. I don't know. Well, okay, if you have a second round grade on Michael Penix, why not take him in the second round? That's a high pick. I still think you have someone who could contribute right away while you're, you know, no doubt having Dak start the season and play the season. Uh, okay. You're welcome to weigh in on that, 855-212-4227. Cowboys, should they take a quarterback? Coming up on Thursdays at this time, we dive into the multiverse of sports. What could have been? You're in a five-minute break.
One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. He's the reigning Fortnite champion. She's a Call of Duty legend. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. We like to do something fun around here on Thursdays, well, every day. But specifically, we like to go back, Perloff, over sports history. Yeah. We look at a what if or a what could have been. We call it the multiverse. Exploring sports' biggest what-ifs and could-have-beens. Let's dive into the multiverse of Maggie and Perloff. All right, Perloff, well, we turn our attention to the NFL Draft, which is going to be happening in just a couple weeks. And today's multiverse of sports what-if or what-could-have-been is what would have happened if Peyton Manning was not drafted by the Indianapolis Colts at one. Now, we remember... This is the 1998 draft, very famous draft, not just because of how much talent ended up being in this draft, but because the lead up to the 98 draft was all about Peyton Manning versus Ryan Leaf, who's a friend of the show um, and has come on with us many times. And sort of who are you going to take, right? Are you going to take the golden boy Mm -hmm. of Peyton Manning, the pedigree with Archie and everything and his famous father and his career at Tennessee? Or do you take Ryan Leaf? who was the strong-armed missile launcher right. uh, out of Washington State and just like this physical sort of specimen. I mean, both guys were like huge and had all the measurables. Right. But Ryan really had that major cannon for an arm. And it was a big question leading up to that draft. So today's multiverse, a what if or what could have been, what happens if the Colts skip on Peyton Manning, presumably to draft Ryan Leaf number one overall? How is the world different? Okay, so... Let's say the Colts take Ryan Leaf and the Chargers get Peyton Manning. I do not think, and I know Ryan very well, and I'm a huge fan. Uh, I love everything he's done in his post-career and his post-days in prison. He's very honest about his problems. I don't think any situation was going to make Ryan uh, the pro that Peyton Manning was because this is based on knowing Ryan's history so well. He was very immature. He was not ready for the NFL. So I don't know what in Indy would have changed that. It's not like Indy right. is Bill Belichick and the Patriots. I do believe system means a lot where you land is important. But the Chargers was not that bad of a spot because they went on to have a lot of success in future years at quarterback right after Ryan was there. So it's not like the Chargers were doomed. I think Ryan would have flamed out just like he did in San Diego. And then, on the other hand, the Chargers because Peyton Manning brought sort of his own thing. He was his own system. Brought that to San Diego. They're winning a Super Bowl, and I'll take it even farther. 
not only are they winning the Super Bowl, I think that team is still in San Diego because he gets a new stadium built. I think everything changes for that franchise if Peyton's there. Now, they did have a lot of success under Martin Schottenheimer. They had, obviously, Drew Brees and Philip Rivers. They knew what they were doing at LaDainian Tomlinson. We talked about earlier in the show. Right. Drafted a lot of great players. But Peyton gets them that Super Bowl. I think they build a new stadium. I just think we view that entire franchise differently Kind of like we view the Colts and Peyton Manning's era now. I think he's a huge hit there. Because when you think about what what about Indy made Peyton Manning great? Nothing really. I mean, it wasn't like he, he got landed with this coach that was an offensive genius. He had Tom Moore as offensive coordinator. It was great. But he you know, was dungy, and it wasn't really an offensive system. He would have done all that in San Diego and maybe even more. Uh, he wasn't indoors, but the weather was still great. I think you win a two ball in Chargers and you flame out in Indianapolis. Uh, okay, so we're doing the multiverse of Maggie and Perloff, which we do every Thursday at this time. A sports what if or what could have been. Today we're going back to the 90, 1998 NFL draft. What if the Colts had not taken Peyton Manning if they had taken Ryan Leaf? How would the world have been different? You think Ryan still would have flamed out because he was battling things that were much bigger than football yep. and that Peyton Manning would have been super successful in San Diego. And oh, in fact, yeah. they would still be in San Diego. Now, I'm going to disagree with you because I know that he's become a bit of a punchline now, but Bill Polian, the architect of the Indianapolis Colts, really was a phenomenal general manager. Okay. And yes, he gets a lot of flack and rightfully so because he was wrong about Lamar Jackson. He said Lamar Jackson should be a wide receiver. Clearly <laughs> that was bad, but he put together um, an amazing team with Marvin Harrison and Edger and James that made Pey Peyton Manning's life a lot better. And Jeff Saturday had had these great cornerstones and foundational pieces that helped Peyton Manning. And I think the general manager was, yes, you got LaDainian Tomlinson and you did have some stars out in San Diego, not like the real team I thought that Peyton Manning had around him. And there's only so much, I think, that a quarterback, even a great one like Peyton, could he have overcome all of that? I don't know. I think having a great architect for the team mm. did help Peyton Manning. So I'm know. not so sure. Is that because Polian built the Bills? Well, is that's that what? just another reason why he's in the Hall of <laughs> is Fame. That, is that what that Bill Polian praise was for? And I'm for? not saying Bobby Beathard was like not a, was like this terrible general manager, but he's a great. He's I, also a Hall. I, is he close to the Hall of Fame? I don't know if he's in. He's close, but it was again even the firepower. You're telling me Marvin Harrison and Edger and James had nothing to do with Peyton Manning's success? I mean, mm, kind of. Oh, gosh. Pay, no. I mean, honestly, you put Marvin Harrison and Reggie Wayne with another quarterback. Are they Marvin Harrison and Reggie Wayne? Of course not. Oh, I think so. Marvin Harrison? And, what, and what about Marvin Edger Harrison? Edger James was one of the great draft like stories. The fact that he got taken over Ricky Williams, who everyone thought was number one, the number one running back in that class. And Marvin Harrison was amazing. Uh, I don't know. Marvin Harrison's not Marvin Harrison without Peyton Manning. And Reggie Wayne's not either. I, that's how I, I mean... Honestly, I'd like to see him go somewhere else. You tell me the Chargers couldn't have gotten receivers to work with Peyton Manning. Is it that hard? Well, I, <laughs> uh, I, I kind of think so. I actually do. Because I, I do think that Polian was doing the right thing here. Um, in building also, too, this I mean, uh, they built a team with Peyton Manning. They won one Super Bowl. I mean, they did make some mistakes over the years as yeah, well. Yeah, but the Chargers won no Super Bowls. Yeah, and in, yeah they would have won one with Peyton Manning. Yeah, I don't. I, I I see it very differently than that. But uh, you are also, welcome to weigh in at eight five five two one two four CBS. Again, we're doing the multiverse of Maggie and Perloff. A what if or what could have been? What happens if the Chargers? Uh, excuse me, the Indianapolis Colts had passed on Peyton Manning and taken Ryan Leaf in the nineteen ninety eight draft. Man, and actually, this was not better. But I'm looking at some of the Chargers draft. They brought in all sorts of great players in the two thousands. That's why they won all these games. Uh, and it actually wasn't Bobby Beathard. He le left in two thousand. I just think that the quarterback determines a lot of this. I actually did a little research, too, by the way, because we had a question last night when we were discussing this. Yeah. Would the Mannings have said no to the Chargers uh, like they did with Eli Manning in 2004? And everything I found was that was not a story with Peyton. Peyton wasn't necessarily averse to the Chargers. A different management at the time. Same owners, the Spanos. Yeah. But it was a different GM. So yeah, I'm not sure Bo that... Uh, Bobby Beathard to John Butler. Right. I'm not sure that they would have said, hey, because they did say Eli is not going to the Chargers. As far as I know, Peyton, if if the Colts had taken Ryan Leaf, I think Peyton would have gone to San Diego. And for some reason, maybe it's just the visual, I think Peyton would have been awesome with that helmet. And I just think he would have brought everything in Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning was so smart that he got all the right pieces in place. I think he would have forced them to really be the elite team that the Colts eventually were. So do you think you think there's absolutely no connection between the fact that Peyton Manning 
probably, I'm assuming, had to have done interviews with the San Diego Chargers yeah. at the time. I think he did, yes. Before the 98 draft. There's no connection at all between anything that happened in 1998 and then Eli Manning in 2004 basically moving heaven and earth, making one of the most awkward situations of all time just to avoid the Chargers? You think well, there's no connection there? Well, it could be, but it could be the aftermath of what happened with Peyton. Um, but you, do you think that Peyton would not have gone to the Chargers? Have you seen that anywhere? I, I don't. I just think that that laid the groundwork. Well, I don't think the Mannings had as much power then, too, because... Eh, I mean, Archie's career was already long over, so his his place in the game is already cemented. So in 1998, you think the Mannings were the Mannings? Um, I, I mean, mean, Peyton was a controversial, somewhat disappointing college football superstar. I, I think it was a way different calculus. Uh, he already had an MVP he, it's not, brother. It's not like he had won the Super Bowl, mm. you know, by the time Eli got there, right? Um, yeah, I think he, uh, no, he hadn't won the Super Bowl, but he had already been an MVP, I believe. He had yeah, a, multiple times he was MVP yeah. at that point. Yeah, By I mean, 2004 only, was he a multi-time MVP already? I think he might have been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was starting to hit big. I okay. Yeah. I mean, he was the By part of the Mannings, year. and he was the number one overall pick. So I do well, still I, think they had a lot of power. Uh, well, he definitely interviewed with them. Uh, he definitely there's there's so much reporting on that draft, and I've never seen someone say Peyton did not want to go to San Diego. But, back back MVP by the way, oh three and oh four. Okay, so it was right there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, I reached out just to help us with this multiverse. I asked for Ryan Leaf if he could come on today. Yeah. He couldn't make it, but he did say uh, he was with me. He said Peyton definitely would have won in San Diego, and I probably would have gone in the same exact direction. Now, Ryan, to his credit, is very Open. realistic yeah. about where he was. And I get one thing I give Ryan credit for on the Ryan Leaf side is he doesn't blame uh, San Diego. He doesn't blame the Chargers. He does for certain things. But he always finds his like it was my fault. I right, screwed right. it up. So I'm going to listen to Ryan on that side. Uh, on the Ryan side, yeah, Indianapolis. You think now they did it. Bill Polian was a great GM, but now we learned that the Ursay family. I mean, there was a lot going on there too. I think he easily could have flamed out in Indianapolis. Yeah, I think for Ryan's side, like you said, and he said yeah. that he just wasn't ready for the NFL. So there was like no. nothing that was going to change that. The the Manning side yes. of it is really the most fa fascinating one. Again, the multiverse of Maggie and Perloff. What if, what could have been if Peyton Manning had not gone to the Indianapolis Colts in 98, if he had gone to the San Diego Chargers? Perloff thinks that it's still a wild success. I'm not so sure. I mean, the other part, too, is different kind of division. You know, you've talked a lot about this. This is more your take than yeah. mine. Your opinion is that Peyton Manning really feasted on the rest of the AFC South, which would not have really been the case. Yeah, but uh, uh, I'm trying to think. The Chargers sure won a lot of games, too. I feel like they dominated the AFC West most of the time Peyton was there. I mean, how many? That, that's the other thing, too. Martin Schottenheimer basically went 13 and 3 every year. I know, and they, they kept firing coaches yeah, who are I mean, actually not bad coaches like they, this there's a there's an ownership part not that the ursays have been you know the banner owners either they've yeah. got their own he's got his own personal things going on but i mean the spanos family has not been the an incredible like the, the people in san diego now despise that family i don't know how many people in la even care and they were not this is not like a really well-run organization well the funny thing is too you know, the ending of this multiverse has a Thanos uh, from Thanos, obviously, yeah. from Avengers of course. feel because there's the big bad guy is sitting out for both guys. <laughs> Who's the person who basically took three rings away from Peyton Manning? Bill Belichick. Who's the guy who screwed the Chargers yeah. out of getting the Super Bowl multiple times? Bill Belichick. That's true. So uh, actually, it, no matter which direction <laughs> you go, it still has the same ending. And that's that dude with the cutoff sweatshirt. But... <laughs> I well, the Chargers found a way to lose to lose to a lot of teams. They lost to Belichick. They lost to the Jets. They they did some losing. Yeah, so did the Colts. I mean, how yeah, many times true. were they at Colts number one seed lost. that that's blew it? True. I mean, Peyton only got one in Indianapolis. So I, I I do think that really the character of the quarterbacks at the time they were picked would have come through. I, I really believe that. I'm not just saying that for this exercise. I I think Peyton could have won in San Diego. Also, though, you know, he played indoor in Indy, which was great, but. The, can't just see him out in that sun slinging it everywhere. It would have been awesome. 855-212-4CBS, 855-212-4227. So that is the what ifs, what could have been Peyton Manning, 1998, if he does not go to the Indianapolis Colts and instead goes to the Chargers, how is the world a different place? Yes. The One other thing about this, go back to the 1998 draft. Good gracious. And we were doing this yesterday with Peyton Manning who goes to the Hall of Fame, 
Charles Woodson goes to the Hall of Fame. Randy Moss goes to the Hall of Fame. He was picked 21. Alan Fanica goes to the Hall of Fame, the offensive lineman. He's picked 26. That's just the first round of that draft. Unreal. Brian is in San Diego, wants to weigh in on the multiverse. A what if, what could have been? What if the Chargers had gotten Peyton Manning instead of Ryan Leaf in 98? Hey, Brian, how are you? All right. Hey, uh, so if we did get Peyton Manning in 98, then we wouldn't have drafted Drew Brees in 2004. And probably we wouldn't have had to get Rivers either because of Peyton Manning's longevity career. Oh, yeah. There's the other doors on this of what happens to Drew Brees and what happens to Phillip Rivers are also fascinating. Yes. And I like the other guys saying that we would have, uh, that they would have still been here in San Diego and that we probably would have gotten to the stadium built. Yeah. Probably called Peyton Manning Stadium. (laughs) You'd have a statue out front of it now, like they do at Indy, right? Didn't they call that literally the house that Peyton built Mm. at the horseshoe? Or whatever they, and then the yeah, Super Lucas Bowl, Oil. The Lucas Super Oil, Bowl would come here every five years. Yeah, there's nothing. San Diego Super Bowl. You guys probably never got to do one of them. No, that was my first Super Bowl ever, 2000. No, we've had, we've Amazing. had, yeah, the worst Super Bowl ever was the was the uh, uh, Raiders and the Buccaneers. The NFL did not like the inside of that stadium. <laughs> they said this stadium is not meant for, you know, such a luxurious game. <laughs> <laughs> so they told the Chargers, build a new stadium and we'll come back. And we all know. But the city, but the city was stupid. Well, we all know what happened there. Brian, thank yeah. you so much for yeah. weighing in from San Diego on our multiverse. What if uh, Peyton Manning had been drafted by the Chargers, not the Colts? So Drew Brees, yeah. 01 draft. 01 draft, yeah. So even a little earlier. So that would have been a whole different calculus for Drew Brees. Wow, that was career. Yeah. First pick in the second round, right? Because first shoulder pick was round. The first out. pick in that first round was uh, LaDainian Tomlinson. I think that's the only thing I may disagree with. With Pearl is, I think Peyton may his struggles may have been longer in San Diego. He had a rough first year in Indy, but San Diego had awful drafts yeah. in '98. Not just Leaf, the other picks '99 and 2000. It Guys, wasn't until Ladadian came in what 2000 and 2001 and same, one. Right, they had right. the same draft. Him and Drew Brees were first round, second round, where then things kind of turned around. So some of these guys, Peyton Manning would have been thrown to. I mean, I, we can argue about whether or not Marvin Harrison is a real dog, whether he went somewhere else. He didn't have Marvin Harrison on these rosters. So I, I think that Peyton Manning, I think he gets to his level because he's great, but I think that that climb is a lot yeah. longer. And I actually wonder if he sees the crap that's happening in San Diego and says, get me out of here. We see that the family eventually saw what the Spanish were doing and said that's not a place to be. I think that all that stuff that happened with Eli – Happens with Peyton there, and he actually gets himself out of there. He's on a whole different team, and he wins titles there. Uh, but actually, San Diego had obviously a great defense, too. Uh, that Indy never, that one year where they got lucky where everyone stayed healthy on defense, San Diego's defense was stacked. Well, he's got Junior Seo, obviously. And uh, Rodney and all those other guys. But too. he's got to make it to 2001. Like, he has, that's three years where you just mm. didn't add real talent. Like, he's got to make it there. Like, Indy, they, they had bad defense. Back then, you'd give quarterbacks three years. It wasn't the end of the world. No, um, but, but EJ saying, what if Peyton doesn't want to right. stick around? Peyton not the, stick the around organization. They won one game in 2000. This was not, this was, I think we think of the Yeah, the they had no quarterback. No, it wasn't just that for all off. They, 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 their team, this is before LaDainian Thompson gets there. That was, that team didn't have a lot of talent. Uh, I think Peyton would have easily won games. Did you see those, did you see Who those was receivers? that quarterback that year? I think it was Harbaugh. Harbaugh was the quarterback in 99. And then they, I don't know who wasn't Eric th- Kramer. They had too. Yeah. Um, you guys I'm, really I'm, don't think Peyton could have won some games there. I'm looking at these this receiving core, and I think that this is a losing team. I'm sorry. Jeff Graham led them in receiving yards in '99. Freddie Jones was second. Oh, I don't know. Who, I don't know yeah, who any of those means. guys are. I'm, and I'm not <laughs> someone who loves football. I don't know who those guys are. Peyton Manning's making that guy Marvin Harrison. Jeff Graham. I don't know. I, I I just don't agree. I think the quarter Peyton Manning could have made anybody great. I mean, when the ball lands between your two numbers, how hard is it to be a good receiver? That's the, the, what I call the Warren Moon effect. Everybody who played with Warren Moon all of a sudden got great. I'm telling you, Peyton would have made all these guys good. And back then, you didn't need to hit in two years. Like, Peyton, living in San Diego, it's so nice. What's, what's you know. <laughs> It's so nice. 855 <laughs> cbs Okay, so that's the multiverse for today. The what if, what could have been. Uh, 1998 draft, an all-time draft, all-time question leading up to the draft. Would the Colts take Peyton Manning or would they take Ryan Leaf? It was a discussion.
charge the uh, Colts take Peyton Manning, but what if they had taken Ryan Leaf? It's not that hard to stretch your mind. What if they had taken Ryan Leaf and the San Diego Chargers had taken Peyton Manning? How would the world be different? 855 212 for CBS. Okay, coming up, we've got a new beef. Who is airing it out today? We'll tell you next. Maggie and Perloff. You're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remain. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen. 
15 seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Not a one-hit wonder, but a great song, Billy Idol. 80s theme this week on Maggie and Perloff. All right, give us a call, 855-212-4227, the multiverse of Maggie and Perloff. What if the Chargers had drafted Peyton Manning and the Colts landed Ryan Leaf? Would it be different? I say the Chargers definitely win a Super Bowl with Peyton Manning. Maggie says that basically the Chargers would not have been good enough. No, I don't think that they would have put a good enough I don't think they would have had a good enough team around Peyton Manning, especially early on. Mm -hmm. It would have been very tough. Peyton Manning came on to a team uh, that had a lot of weapons in it. It was Marvin Harrison. It was Edger and James. uh, It was just Hall of Famers around Peyton Manning. Um, And so we're doing the multiverse. We're going back to the 1998 draft. It was a lot lot of controversy leading up to a lot of who will they choose, a what if. And what if the Colts, instead of going with Manning, had gone with Ryan Leaf, as Perloff says? We both kind of think that maybe Ryan would have had similar issues. We know Ryan very well. Perloff knows him very, very well. That maybe he just wasn't ready for the NFL. Yeah. But the Peyton Manning side of this is interesting because if Peyton goes to the Chargers, are they winners? What happens to Drew Brees' career? What happens to Phillip Rivers' career? There's just a lot of different dominoes and sliding doors for this one. Well, it's funny. We were t- One aspect of this, uh, would the Chargers have built a winner fast enough to keep Peyton Manning? This is modern think. That's, Back yes. then, quarterbacks didn't go anywhere. He signed, the day he signed, he signed a six-year deal uh, for $46 million. And at that point, like players played out those six-year deals. It, w- it was different. You were allowed to have growing pains. Now you can't. Now it's like two years in. What, what are we going to do with this guy? <laughs> well, you're right, but that that's the modern is like superstars looking around to find like a better situation. Oh, yeah. the However, NBA model. But you did have John Elway who didn't want to go, you know, to play for the Colts. You did have Jim Kelly didn't want to play for the bills. Ironically, you did have guys who did try to manipulate where they were going in the draft. And then only six years later, Peyton's little brother did it by not going to San Diego, going to New York. Right. But you didn't have the NBA thing where guys were all of a sudden trying to get out of their team. No, not signing a deal. And then the next day saying, trade me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, give me $250 million. And by the way, get me out of here. Yeah. And also there wasn't nearly as much play. I feel like there wasn't as much play movement like this year yeah i guess you had like aaron Rodgers and kirk cousins and all this now we expect guys to really move around and the cowboys for example are not going to resign dak prescott but we are like well somebody will somebody will come loose it always happens now back then it was a different time it was a, it was a great time where they didn't care about concussions and players <laughs> stayed in the same place it was different nfl i'm just thinking yeah. back to 1998 and Peyton manning I just think uh, if you have Peyton Manning, just the uniform, wouldn't that have looked cool? You get the powder blues slinging it all well, over the place. They were powder blues in those. I first, think they were in the Navy. the Navy. Yeah, did they have an alternate? When did that alternate that come out? That started around like 2002, 2003. Either way, in the sun, I just think that it would have been <laughs> it would have been great, uh, and Peyton would have been fine. Now, Indy, it's interesting. What? Where were they? Eventually, Ryan Leaf would have been gone in three years. Yeah, where would they have turned? Mm, maybe in two thousand, they draft a young man out of Michigan. Tom Brady. I'm just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. But, I, I know Bill Polian was a good GM. I don't know if anyone was good enough to see Tom Brady coming. Yeah, I'm just Obviously, saying. It's interesting check, because but... then the Colts would have had to go in a completely different direction. Maybe the local guy, Drew Brees. Possible. Mm, uh, 855 like 855-212-4227. So you are welcome to weigh in on a multiverse today. If the 1998 draft had gone differently at the top, what if Peyton Manning had gone to the Chargers, not the Colts? Ryan Leaf would have gone to the Colts. Andrew Bogus is here with Headlines. Hello. Hello again, guys. Uh, Mother Nature is finally cooperating in Augusta. The Masters will now begin at 1030 Eastern, delayed a few hours because of bad storms since last night. Tiger Woods' new tee time is now 354 Eastern. Sunset is just before 8 o'clock. There are groups after Tiger, so they probably cannot finish the entire first round today. I'm sure the doubts will continue, but Shohei Otani about to get the all clear from federal authorities. The New York Times says the investigation of Ipe Mizuhara has determined that Otani was a victim of massive theft. His former interpreter may have taken more than the $4.5 million we've heard. Part of the alleged scheme allegedly included Mizuhara changing the settings 
of Otani's account, so he did not get alerts for transactions. Mizuhara is expected to soon plead guilty to these federal okay. charges. So you got okay. So this is looking like a little bit more cut and dry right now. Mizuhara, simply the bad guy, a bad actor who got in over his skis with a bookmaker and stole from his best friend to try to get himself out of it. Don't you still want to know about the wire transfers, though? Even if this is all true, mm -hmm. do you still have questions? Are you willing to say, okay, we know it's Otani's translator was the bad actor. I'm good. I don't need any more facts of this case. Well, is it possible? First of all, I think they will get to it. Is it possible that the translator, Ipe, said to the financial guys, Shohei needs this money for this, that, or the other thing, and he concocted some lie? Because we already, right. if all the other stuff is true, then we know he's a master liar. So maybe it doesn't seem beyond... Uh, the realm of thought that he could have figured out a way to do that. And just manipulating that. I just find it crazy to think that this, as the dollar amount gets higher, even if you are a multimillionaire, as the dollar amount gets six figures, that you don't need the actual person to be signing off. Like, Ipe doesn't have power of attorney. You know, it's not like he, and he's not a financial person who's not a certified financial advisor. So how does he authorize $500,000 wire transfers. Don't you have to get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak? So the feds are going to sit in a room with this guy and ask that very question, and he has to tell the truth according yep. to the law. Don't you? I, I, would I just hope, want to know. I would hope they get to the bottom of it, and I would hope that somebody uh, releases that to the public because I want to know too. But I think there is ways to do this. Maybe he electronically signed for it. He could have got into uh, Shohei's computer. There's a lot of things to do. I mean, listen, my years of embezzling from Dan Patrick, <laughs> I learned all sorts of tricks. I was saying, Dan never knew a thing, never yeah, suspected. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Dan, what's your password? I got to, uh, <laughs> I got to email somebody. No, it's I like, uh, Dan, what's your mother's maiden name again? <laughs> and, uh, what was the last, uh, four digits of your social? Uh, yes. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> just some run of the mill questions I have as a big fan. Fortunately, Dan was very generous. We did not have to steal from him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. He's paying you golf. Yeah, you guys yeah, off yeah. one, one Traeger grill at a time. Yeah, yeah. The, Dan, Dan was smart. He's like, well, I'm going to give these guys all sorts of great goodies. That way they won't steal from me like Ipe. I know. Maybe Otani should have been. Uh, do you think he was like stiffing him on Christmas gifts and stuff? And, mm. and Ipe thought he had it, he owed it to him? No, you're, you're absolutely right. That is the big question. But they they can't just get past this whole thing and make it go away and not answer that question. They have to They're give it to us. They're going to try. You think they will? I bet you we get an answer on that. It's to, it's It's best for him. I agree with Maggie that they answer it. That they figure out that answer. Like they said, he's cooperating, and I know right. that they. Uh, the article also said that he's spoken to authorities. I don't know if you just mentioned that. I'm sorry if you did. I have not. But I'm, I'm actually going in through my Chase account right <laughs> now. What do you got? Hand it like, over. So, like, I'm on the like. If I I could right now, I could just do a wire transfer up to a hundred thousand dollars. Now, I don't know if that's based on my finances if that's a chase rule i don't know if there are different levels of your daily transfer <laughs> limit based on what your account is you have a hundred thousand no no no, no i don't but I, so my guess is that's like the that's the starting thing right can we thing, have right? breakfast or something wait no, in no, your no, chase okay. account no no not that i ha please i barely have a thousand dollars in my account <laughs> right now your mother's maiden name? my point is that's the first hurdle i've gotten right to what you're see what you seem to be confused by so if epe had because don't forget as close as they are, there's a daily three-hour window where Shohei's playing a baseball game, and Ipe could be, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. And he runs back to the clubhouse, and he's got Shohei's phone. Wire foam, transfers himself five And he gets thousand. into, if, as long as he, if he has access to Shohei's phone, yeah. or if he had access to my phone and could get through to this point, he'd be able to send somebody up to 100000 uh, Well, I don't have 100000 but that's the, again, that's the first <laughs> thing you can't that's a stop to me is right. that limit. So a, like a different account might have a different higher limit. Right. And then it's done. I was reading thieves, if they get a hold of your phone and your password, can drain your accounts within an hour. Right. Every single account you have. So those are thieves that don't know anything. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, apparently... Bogus is dealing in that <laughs> kind of world. No, I, well, I had here's no the idea. thing. If any of us like get, ever get taken hostage or anything like that and we need some cash quickly, I yeah. mean, I think Bogus is now the first call. I'm going to say this one more time. That was fine print. It <laughs> has nothing to do with anything in my account. But but I guess my whole, whole thing has been I've been surprised by how confused you, some EJ, Pete, and you, Maggie, yeah. have been about how did this happen. And 
I basically just almost did it in three seconds. Yeah. Like it's not, it's just, mm-hmm. it's not as hard as it seems you guys think it is. I guess, I think it's our interview with David Sampson, who's the former president of the Marlins, who's been around and handed out these massive contracts to people who, it that raised a red flag with him. And he's seen guys yeah. get drained out of their bank accounts and get taken advantage of. And even he, who would have had a firsthand view of that, even he had a lot of questions. I think the ultimate skepticism that remains with me is how the story just changed so fast, right? And so all we have now is just going on people's words and people's words seem to change. For a second there, it was like by the hour. And so that's why to me, I can't take Ipe at his word I don't know if I can take Shohei at his word, and it feels like there's so much there to try to obfuscate what the truth might actually be. Maybe it is the truth, and maybe that's the Occam's razor, and it's just the most uh, obvious thing is the thing. But I also think it's possible that there's everyone has a got a vested interest. The, the agent, Major League Baseball, the Dodgers, they were lying to Otani or not being truthful with Otani. They were withholding information from him. Why wouldn't they withhold information from the public? Wait, who I is ju- lying to Otani? They never went to him and said anything about reporters snooping around, about uh, a possible bookmaker. They kept him in the dark. Who they, did? The Dodgers? The or Dodgers yes. and Major League Baseball. And the Dodgers sure. helped and the agents. Them tell people to talk to Mizuhara. Like, originally, the Dodgers were involved in Mizuhara talking to, like, ESPN and stuff, and were they CAA not? And was, too. It was, like, right. Shohei's spokespeople, quote-unquote, who were, like, handing Ipe to ESPN. Like, all this stuff, to me, is just, it, it feels like it's all the one big misdirection, so I just can't blanketly say I believe everyone. Right. So, I mean, and, and I would agree with the idea, which I think what David Sampson said, was that somebody should have seen the wire transfer. I, that's what I said last in the first hour. Like, I still think there's a money person that has to be either terrible at his or her job right. or somehow <laughs> was hoodwinked by Mizuhara as well. Or in on it. But the idea that Mizuhara could make a wire transfer in place of Shohei Otani is easy. Is not the, is, is, that's not impossible. He could have, he could have done that. Somebody should have caught it. Right. Other than Otani in the Otani world, but he could have done it. At the, the initial act is easy. Because he had the password. Well, I would argue that there's never been anyone in sports or any other field who is in a better position to steal from somebody than an interpreter. I right. mean, this guy is, you cannot, he is the voice of Shohei Otani. It's an incredible personal thing. I mean, he could have been doing all sorts. He could have basically been massaging everything Otani said the last five years that we wouldn't even know. Well, but that's the thing. Yeah, well, uh-huh. not publicly because there's other people who speak Japanese. But I'll bet, you, I bet you everybody comes to Ipe. I'll bet you the Dodgers come to him because they, I'll bet you Shohei keeps a distance from all those people. I don't, just, don't you think that Ipe is the first call? I just, I, the, the problem I had, because Bogus mentioned the issues I had, it goes even beyond that. My, the issue I have is just an explanation of why he has access to the banking information. Well, he might have stole it. That, well, that's well, what they're, they're not saying that. They're saying that he had access and he changed password or changed the alerts, alerts so yeah. that he can see. I'm like, all right, why does why does Ipe have access to that? Like these apps can translate to Japanese. Like there's no reason why you would need a translator to go through your banking. You just wouldn't. And I would assume that and I, I put a lot of money, not $100,000, Bogus, but a <laughs> lot of money that whatever app that that, that uh, Shohei has, or whatever bank he has, is all in Japanese so he can understand it. So that's the only part I mm. don't understand, and I feel like we will learn either Shohei was foolish in giving some guy access to millions and millions of dollars, or there's something else that was missing from that. That's yeah. the biggest thing I, for me. I think that what they're... What they're doing is pinning everything on Ipe because mm-hmm. I think maybe A, it's true. Maybe he deserves everything pinned on him totally. And also, that's the easiest way to make this thing go away. Who they being the, but that, who's your they? My they is Ipe probably pleading guilty. So taking the fall himself. Right. No, you're saying they're pinning everything on Ipe. Who's they? Uh, Well, Ipe. Yes, but he I, can't plead guilty to something he didn't do. He can't walk in and go, "I did it," and they'll go, and the federal authorities will go, right. "Okay, fine, yeah. we got it." Like right, right, he's right. putting guilty to things that they have, that they say he and they have proved they in their mind that, that he, he did. did. Well, I feel feel like you're they. My point was that it's a Dodgers, MLB, um, anyone who's but in, yeah, anyone who can anyone benefit be from making, this. Anyone that's who'd a, be that's making money the, off those of Shohei. idiots a lot of credit to be able to figure <laughs> all that out. Uh, well. The other thing too is that at this level, I don't think Mike Trout pays his own bills. I, I don't think these guys are in their banking apps all the time. If you 
I think th- at that level, it works completely differently. Like he's, do you think Mike Trout, who has eight hundred million or something, is actually paying his electricity bill? Maybe not. Or like but going then, into his app and his but bank. Your electricity app? bill is not five hundred thousand dollars. Right. And yeah, I, and but I bet you like there are levels to this. Maybe, but I that goes back to my question though, and and this is where I think we disagree. I don't see why the translator would be the person that's doing your banking. Like, I get that they're important to your getting your message to the world, being uh, in between your banking. I don't understand that. Now, if he can just say why that is, then I, then I'm good. Then I've heard everything I need to hear. That's the only missing element that I don't quite understand. And it's it's just like, well, he's a translator. Well, I think why they're not? gonna say he stole the information. Uh, that, that's yeah. what I. Or think. what if they say they were. That's the relationship Shohei thought that they had was like that's his best friend in a yeah. foreign country. He we don't I don't know when this when this um, relationship began right. with his wife. I don't know where she's been geographically for the mm. last like so. If that was his person here, and either he was lazy or he was preoccupied by baseball or he was dumb with money. And he trusted Ipe. Why? I, like, 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 that's not a huge leap to me either. Wait, what well, if it, no. If, it, if that's the case, then fine. Say it. Which what, is, is what we talked about a couple weeks ago, but it was in here. Just say that that's the case. Why can't they say that? Well, well like, what, again, if it was I, a, what, if, what if it was a personal assistant and not an interpreter? What if, um, let's say a famous person, The Rock, has $500 million in the bank and his personal assistant stole money? That kind of makes sense. And maybe Ipe was more than a translator. Mm. Maybe it was like the personal assistant who has access to everything. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I would say there's got to be more than one person who yeah. speaks Japanese <laughs> who can work in a banking industry who could also have been translating for Shohei. It didn't all have to be Ipe. But again, we should move on. There's got to be more going on today, uh, There's right? actual baseball. Oh, uh, National Sibling Day apparently was yesterday. So perfect timing for Bo and Josh Naylor. Here it comes. A swing and a line drive, base hit, right center, game winner, Bo Naylor. Tyler Freeman comes home from third. There'll be a mobbing between first and second as Bo Naylor gets Cleveland its first walk-off win of the season. Tom Hamilton, Guardians Radio. Bo with the game-ending hit after Josh had the game tying hit bottom 10. They also each homered in the fourth inning yesterday. Cleveland beat the White Sox 7-6 in 10. It is like the airing of the grievances. First, LaDainian Tomlinson. Now it's Cam Newton peeved that the Falcons are paying Kirk Cousins. Newton was on Shannon Sharp's podcast. What the Falcons paid Kirk Cousins. They could have got Cam Newton, Justin Fields, and Michael Vick. Right now? <laughs> Today? Uh, Newton, That's a heck of a quarterback room. Newton's particularly bothered by Cousins and his Achilles getting paid while injuries were always held against Cam. How am I supposed to feel? Because the same questions and the same concerns that you had with me, obviously you done overlooked that. You see, don't have, don't have those concerns with him. And if you give Kirk Cousins my resume, he probably would have got more. But I'm tripping. But I'm bitter. But I'm mad. I'm not. I'm just exposing the truth. And it's for you to, to, to digest it however you feel. You guys digest that. <laughs> yeah. I'm just here asking the questions. Uh, I mean, Cam does sound very, very bitter here. Not to say that he doesn't have a point. Um, but, I mean, it's not only is Cam not making Kirk Cousins money. He's not making any money, is he? Is he? No, he's not on a roster. Yeah, I'm just saying there's something. It feels like. It's something else is going on with Cam, right? Because he's a year younger than Kirk, and he can't even make a team. So, why? Well, I, been, I'm kind of curious. He's been myself. bad. What? He's been bad. Yeah, he's been bad. So it feels like he's ignoring that part of it. <laughs> yeah, that's a, big, <laughs> that's a big issue. Do you think Shannon's gonna push but finally, back? And even that being said, he's good enough to be a backup. That's even a weird. It was. Too. It is very odd. But it's even Cam right? himself acknowledged, like having a former MVP as a backup can be a dicey situation yeah. for the starter. Um, but it's been many years since Cam's like really been. The dude is he's another an one awesome of those. TV. We have these guys that were like, wait, that guy is that young? Cam's thirty four years old. It's just bizarre to me that he's done. Yeah, I I think that he's asking the right questions about Kirk Cousins. These are ones that I've asked. You know, the day that yeah. he signed with the Atlanta Falcons, like you're just throwing a bunch of money to a guy who's coming off an Achilles tear. Yeah. It doesn't seem like a no brainer that this is going to work. I don't see the Falcons automatically red carpet all the way to the Super Bowl. I think he's asking questions that are fair. He does sound extremely bitter, though. This is, it's not a good look for him, I don't think. Like, you're a former MVP, you won the Heisman, you had your own career, 
to call out Kirk Cousins now. Doesn't that sound, it seems a little petty, no? It seems very petty because you're right. He's more of a football icon than Kirk Cousins is. But let's be real. Kirk Cousins has been better than Cam Newton for a decade. For a decade. He's been better than Cam Newton. So Cam Newton can talk about all, like, why my, what mm-hmm. my resume is, what I've done. Kirk Cousins has been better than you for a decade. Like, I, I love Cam Newton. He's one of my, he was one of my favorite players watching him when I was younger. But we, we're we four years removed from him throwing for even 3,000 yards in the season. Yeah. I mean, come on, Cam. Like, you've been hurt. You went to the Patriots. You were not good. You had a great – you had not a great opportunity because they sucked. But, like, you had the opportunity to start most of the season. You lost your job there. I mean, you went bad to team. Bad team in New England. Bad team in Carolina. Kirk Cousins has been throwing to maybe the best receiver in the league. Was Washington mm. a good team when he was Justin there? Justin Jefferson, I'm talking about. Right. But went I mean, to Minnesota. Kirk Cousins was putting up numbers in Washington. Washington, he's the only quarterback besides Robert Griffin that's done anything for the last 20 years right. in Washington. Like, Kirk, like this idea that Kirk Cousins is just some bum, I, I get he doesn't win. I get he's bad in prime time. But they got to put some respect on his name. Cam Newton, like, you just haven't been... As good as Kirk Cousins. He's got a one and three playoff record, and he's made $200 million. Cam has More. Been, he's been in the playoffs million. since then? I don't know if he's been in the playoffs since they lost that Super Bowl. No, but he's been a better postseason player. Yeah, but it was a long time ago. The, the, the conversation now is can Kirk Cousins win you a Super Bowl? For Cam, it's should he be on a roster? They're two different quarterbacks now. No, it's true. But again, I, I just think I'm with Cam about the contract that Cousins got with Atlanta. I think it's eyebrow raising for sure. And huh. but But he does sound bitter. Yeah, I mean the market is usually it's a hundred million accurate. dollars. I mean, he, yeah, he threw eighteen touchdowns in eight games last year. Well, I mean, I'm just saying there were multiple teams who want him. Yeah, the, uh, I think Cam was implying that the market is fly. I, I think he was kind of saying the white quarterbacks get paid more was the implication, right? He said Michael Vick, Justin Fields, they can't. That's what he was saying. I mean, without saying it, but it's it's not they saying it about Kirk. It's him. No one else is saying this about Kirk Cousins, right? Cam is has a particular advantage on this, so I agree with Maggie. Like there is a reason to listen to him, but I also agree with you. Like obviously, Kirk's better now. I think Kirk could be good this year. I think Atlanta's going to the playoffs. What's your problem with Kirk Cousins coming off an Achilles? Thirty six. Yeah, that that's that's my issue with it. Bogus, thank you so much. And a lot packed in there. Uh, coming up next, we've got a check in with Aaron Rodgers. What did he say today? Only you will find out next. Maggie and Perlo. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining.
two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. What the f*** is Aaron Rodgers up to today? Back on the podcast circuit, Aaron Rodgers on the I Can Fly podcast, which is hosted by Morgan Hoffman, who is a professional golfer, and um, Jeg Coughlin III. This is where conversations become inspiration. And I got to be honest, Rodgers is really opening my eyes to all these different podcasts where – Men, <laughs> men talk about their feelings. It's been enlightening. Um, talking about his ayahuasca trips, uh, ceremonies, I guess, is the better term for it. First, I didn't realize this. Rogers just sort of explained the essence of this uh, plant-based psychedelic. Uh, the signature of Aya is the mm-hmm. grandmother. Mm-hmm. But this was a whole nother level of just feeling like that beautiful, divine, feminine energy just kind of holding us and some moments of difficulty (laughs) yeah okay uh also on his Mm -hmm. approach to ayahuasca it's not actually excitement it's it's hard work i'm not recommending people do it you know i think that's a line you have to draw like when the medicine calls you then then listen and and lean in Mm -hmm. but uh it's tough work you know you're not when when i agreed to do this last retreat I i wasn't thinking oh man i can't wait and trip in the jungle. No. I was thinking, okay, it's gonna be some tough work. Yeah, intense stuff. Him talking about ayahuasca, which has become like an off-season ritual, I think, for him. Uh, I know he was in Costa Rica recently and and took part in one of these ceremonies. Now there was another part of this that I found kind of interesting too, because it's something that we all live through. And that was, do you remember Y two K? They were asking uh, about like uh, some of Rogers, like just fears in his life. Right. And he revealed this. How I grew up, Y2K was probably a bigger deal. Uh, it just seemed to be. There was a lot of people in our sphere who thought the world was going to end in 2000. And so I had a major fear of the world ending. <laughs> what? Yeah, California. They're all 
all weird out there. No, Wait, I'm just on. kidding. Wait, I remember Y2K. I was in high school. And obviously when 1999 flipped over to 2000, and people thought the computers were going to have a tough time adapting to the change. But did anyone think the world was going to end? Oh what God. is he talking about? Are you serious? I do not remember this oh, at all. I was in my bubble, Y2K I guess, was upstate New York. Bringing it all down. <laughs> what? When? The, uh, the planes, what? the computers, everything. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't there a... There was um, the a world lawsuit. was going to end. There the was bank a lot accounts. of churches that came out and said, like, prepare for end of the world packages. You know the show Righteous Gemstones? Yeah. They did a huge thing. They made their millions off Y2K packages. <laughs> I know, but that's satire. I, a I satire based on reality. There was a lot of end of world stuff going on. I don't remember that. And I thought that was kind of revealing from Rogers about what he did, what he grew up around. Imagine being, you know, you're 16 or whatever, and people around you think that the world is going to end. What are you supposed to do with that? Wait, but you guys, you never heard Apocalypse and Y2K? You never never thought? You didn't think it was all ending then? No. I I, I remember it being like, oh, maybe the, you know, the computers are going to have trouble, but I never thought that had spelled trouble. certain doom for me. You just thought it had trouble? Like, oh my gosh, my cable's going to go out for a week? <laughs> I did not. I didn't give it, I didn't pay it this much mind. I really did. I, I was in high school and I was, maybe I was a little isolated. I don't know. Yeah, maybe you were. Yeah, you're probably busy on your high school thing. But yeah, I, I sure remember Y2K was. That was a big, big deal. The, I mean, there was a real chance that every single thing in society was going to stop working on a dime. So then everyone woke up after everything was fine, and they what fixed did all, it? Yeah. And what did all these like fatalists do? Just like, all yeah, right, well, just, I guess I was wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which fortunately is the way end of world stuff has worked so far. <laughs> so far. <laughs> oh, no. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining.
one minute remaining. Five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. She can run the 40 faster than Tom Brady. He got a perfect score on the Wonderlick. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. I understand the fascination with Tiger Woods still at the Masters. He'll tee off at 3.30 Eastern this afternoon. But Perloff, I don't like watching this version of Tiger. Welcome to the show, Maggie Gray, Andrew Perloff. You know, listen, Tiger's body, Perloff, is just, it's just not anywhere close to what someone needs to be able to compete at this high level in the Masters. Admirable that he still gives it a go, but at this point, I'd almost rather see him retire than have to watch this version of Tiger Woods limping around the course, worth of drawing from tournaments before he even to play four rounds. This is a, this feels sad to me now with Tiger. Wait, you really would want him to retire? Don't, competitive you, golf, yes. Oh, my God. Aren't you dreading his retirement? Like, what happens to golf if he walks away? I'd rather have him... Try it. 60% of Tiger is better than 0% of Tiger. See, but that's a fear for life after any kind of star, you know, goes away. We've talked about this a lot with Caitlin Clark for women's college basketball. You know, are you going to be able to retain your audience? That's on golf. That's on golf to try to get the next stars because Tiger is still, you're never going to move on with the sport while Tiger is still here. You know, he takes up all the headlines. This this should not be Tiger's tournament. He's 969th in the world right now and can't get through four rounds of golf. But why does it hurt golf to have him there? I don't think it hurts golf well, because I don't think, again, he becomes the story. Yeah, He's that's always good. the story. No, I think you want other guys who are younger and in their prime to be the story. I think that, first of all, I think he's 48. I think he's going to have, he's going to have a chance again. Maybe not this year. It seems really bleak. I, obviously, he's not getting through any tournaments. But, uh, you know, what if in four years his back is okay? Uh, backs backs come and go. Listen. <laughs> but it is just the back. That'd be one thing. It's the back. It's the knee. It's been now the ankle because of that devastating car crash. When he won the Masters in 2019 in this improbable way, it really was that, – that was before this devastating car accident. Yeah, but he was already, lucky to be alive. He'd already missed <laughs> – Two full years of golf with injuries because uh, I think it was the knee, right? Before that. So it's not like he hasn't been down and out before. Honestly, golf is a funny sport. I just think that it, it, he could catch fire one day in one tournament. And for as a, as a fan, I, I want to see it. I'm, I'm willing to suspend belief that he can do it again. I'm willing to hold out hope that Tiger Woods will be back. Again, it might not be this year. But still, if you ask me, who am I watching at Augusta? Of course it's Tiger Woods. So why would I not want that option? Because I don't think this end for him, this seems, well, you're not saying it's an end, and he's not saying it's an end. But I hear things like this. Can we hear the cut from him, Ryan, please, about how much pain Tiger Woods plays through just to be at Augusta? Is it worse here? And are you playing with playing with painkillers? Uh, I hurt every day. Yeah. <laughs> please, so, yes. I, I, I ache. No, I, I ache every day. And um, I, I prefer it warm and humid and hot. And uh, I know we're getting some thunderstorms, so at least it'll be hot. It won't be like last year. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, maybe. I, I don't know. The weather certainly plays a role for sure. There's more from Tiger. Uh, the ankle actually feeling okay right now because of a fusion surgery, but that doesn't mean he's feeling great. 
that you love and given so much to? Well, the ankle doesn't hurt anymore. It's fused. It's not going anywhere. Um, so that, that's fine. Uh, it's other parts of my body that are now have to take the brunt of it. Um, so, yeah, once you put the rods in there, it's, it's good to go. Um, but, you know, the, the, the back, the knee, and other parts of the body have to take the, the load of it. And just the endurance capability of, of walking a long time and being on my feet for a long time. I mean, how much does he have to give? How much more does he have to give for the sport? He's given his body. He's given, you know, the I, a lot of mental anguish of demons that he's had to overcome and do that in a really public way. I mean, at this point, I'm not saying take the sport away from him. He can still do the ceremonial golf stuff, but this ending is not befitting of his whole career. This is watching somebody at the end struggle because their body is breaking down, and I don't think this is the the worthy way out for a champion and someone who reached the heights of Tiger Woods. This just feels like pretty sad. The guy really can't finish tournaments at this point. Yeah, but we, he's been there before and come back and win. Uh, you say that, but there's always a chance. That, and it'd be stupid if he hung him up, then he's probably leaving some tournament win uh, on the table. That's just the way golf is. You're telling me he can't at least win the you know some PGA tournament, the Valspar at one point? All he has to do is put together four days of golf. Which he can't do. I think he, it's a pipe dream. It's a hope yeah, that, I mean, that fans have for him that's just not realistic right now. It's like, you know, asking, like, you know, guys, anyone who's at the end of their career after giving their lives and their bodies to a sport, at some point enough is enough. And it, it's not because the player themselves may want to hang it up. At some point, the sport retires you. Golf? Yeah, every other sport, not golf. What, what is he's the not sad, competitive right now. What is the sad ending to a golf career? Nobody's ever said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe we're watching Jack Nicklaus or Arnie Palmer or any of those guys walk around the course. It's fine. I know, but you don't think this is a little bit sad for Tiger that he can't get through a tournament? I mean, the odds are even that he makes the cut. Even. Okay, that's making the cut, but that's, that's pretty, not what his goal that's is right competitive. now. competitive. No, that's fine, and he's going for 24 straight deal. cuts at the Masters, which would break the record. I understand there's other milestones that he can achieve, but when you're at the level and go, the legacy of Tiger Woods, simply making a cut while admirable, that's not what this is about. But it means you're close enough. You, that, and by the way, there's no guarantee he's going to make this cut. But if he does, that means he's close enough to compete. I mean, that's pretty good to make the cut. I, at the I think Masters. that's a leap. I think just making the cut doesn't mean you're in the uh, le- you're not page one of the leaderboard just because you make the cut. No shot. I don't know. There are a lot of guys, a lot of incredibly competitive golfers who are not going to make the cut. I mean, these you say youth. I mean, they're going to be probably Dustin Johnson or somebody at that level will not make the cut this year. I think if you make the cut at the Masters, you are okay, definitely but, good enough to be in in contention in the next five years. Well, then, but that's the, then let's move the goalpost then, because if it's just about making the cut and that's the thing, then we can't be out here saying I think he can win it all and I think this is possible because that's not it. That's two very different things: making the cut and actually winning the tournament. Right, but if he can make the cut now, when he's particularly injured, right. then who who knows what he can do a year from now, two years from now? His mastery of that course is a real deal, and that's just this major. There's four of them. Yeah, you know, some of the really long courses would probably be a problem for him, but I I'm definitely not counting him out because there's a long time. There's a lot of golf left if he can at least hold it together at all physically and just wants to get out there. Again, we've seen old guy. You dismissing my old guys. Phil was fifty, and, and just Phil is an outlier. And Phil was an outlier. To Tom win Watson a tur- was sixty. To, to win a tournament. To win a tournament. Tom Watson was sixty, and if he could have parred the final hole, would have won the British Open. Okay, but didn't. And Phil did, but I mean it's that's not, pretty darn close. Okay, but it was one putt away. So from you give winning. me two examples, and it's so it's not all the time that these older guys are able to win these tournaments. And I guess I'm just positing this, right? Do you think as Tiger gets older, yeah. do you think, does your body generally get better or get worse? Why do you need this body? Like, he's not playing <laughs> basketball. Is Scotty Scheffler's body anything to to look at? Or no, is Deki no, Matsuyami's body anything? Who no, cares? Prof, it's like literally about walking around the course. And you say the Masters. Walking it's, around the course. It's like one of the, he has trouble with that. I mean, it's one of the more rigorous uphill and hilly you know, courses and just, yes, just walking is a challenge to walk four days and to, to do this. It's hard for him to prepare for it. And then I think it's hard to do it. Yeah. I mean, I think this year is going to be hard, but I think if he gets healthier and healthier and healthier, gets farther away from the car accident, if he could get in that window where he's not too old, I think if he can walk the course, 
I think to count him out would be silly in my mind. 855-212-4CBS. Let's go to Stewart's in North Carolina. Hey, Stuart, good morning. Good morning. Great show as always. Um, Maggie, these are the same comments you would have said in 2016 and 17 when Tiger hadn't won in three and four years and was a complete physical mess. And there may never be, an, and I'm not even the biggest Tiger fan, but sure. there may never be a greater two wins in the history of golf than when Tiger won, I believe it was the Tour Championship in 18, his first win in five-plus years, and the Masters in 19. Um, and that's what people are living for. I mean, there's one golfer in the last 25 years that has moved a TV needle one ounce, and it's Tiger Woods, and he's moved it way more than one ounce. Nobody else touches a TV needle, but Tiger Woods and fans, whether they like him or not, they're waiting for him to have that one more glorious moment. Yeah, but I think that's all, Stuart, I think it's hope. You know, I think at this point, I, you don't have the evidence, and – you know, well, the maybe, evidence was what he did in 2018 and 19. I know, but look what's happened since. But look what's happened since. I mean, not only getting five years older, devastating car accident where he now he's got rods in his ankle. I mean, let's not pretend like he's been sitting on a beach for the last five years. It's it, it's not. You know, this old the degree of difficulty just gets higher and higher as he moves forward. Don't you think he gets older? No doubt. But but that's. That's why people will watch because if people will say if anybody can do it, he will do it. And the one thing he won't do is sit on a beach. Right. He will work to get healthy. Yeah. To try yeah, but- to have that one glorious moment. Now, maybe it won't be the Masters because of the hills and, and, and other issues that just compound his, you know, what his health is. Right. But people are waiting for that one moment and it's not going to be some random golf tournament. It's going to be a big one. Cause that's the ones he's going to play for the most part. Yeah. Stuart, I, I get it. And I know that tiger has just given us so many of those moments, but uh, and thank you for the phone call and the perspective. I, I just think that's us. You know, that's tiger wanting it too. And it's just us projecting on it. I think we all have to get real on this, you know, life's yeah. not a movie and, uh, I, I think if you were going to put odds on this, I don't know how you could say the odds are in his favor that he's going to come out of nowhere and win a tournament. Yeah. And I that's mean, what it would be out of nowhere. I just think too, like he's not going to sit and watch older. Oh, so there's huge trends of older golfers competing in the majors. Like they never did before. There's 48, 49, 50 year olds. He's not going to watch older golfers compete and just sit on a beach. Why also too, I think maybe if he slows down that swing a little, stops being so darn ferocious all the time, <laughs> maybe he gets a little more out of his other edges. I think it I th- definitely he will be a factor in his fifties. There's no reason for him to go to senior tour. And that's not even really a thing anymore. I'm reading of all the old golfers who've had success. I mean, you can you could really compete. Phil Mickelson's record is not gonna last being the oldest major winner at fifty, because there are all sorts of guys competing now. Tiger will be back. I don't think it's this year. I'm not betting on him this year. I guarantee you he will be heard from again in a major. 855-212-4CBS. 855-212-4227 is how you can get in touch with the show. You can always watch us at youtube.com slash CBS Sports Radio, twitch.tv slash CBS Sports Radio. I noticed this comment the other day when we were in all of our wrestling attire and our get-ups, EJ and I in the matching singlets, Perloff in the Rowdy Roddy Piper uh, costume. A lot of people saying, oh, I had not... I had never tuned in to you guys before. So this is what you look like. Ah, kind of nice to put <laughs> oh, some no. faces with some names. EJ had the luchador mask on, so you didn't get his full face. That's but true. this is a fun way to watch the show if you find yourself in front of your computer or obviously your phone, youtube.com slash CBS Sports Radio, twitch.tv slash CBS Sports Radio. And you can come jump in the chat with the widows and the coffee drinkers. They are a lot of fun. Okay, 855-212-4CBS. Have people been bringing up the... Uh, the WrestleMania stuff to you a lot? I've been getting it a lot. Uh, not so much. Around the building, I was out to dinner last night with some college friends. They all brought it up. Wow. They're like, you're a wrestle- wrestling person now? <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> look at me. That's awesome. I know. What did you say? I was like, I that was a once-in-a-lifetime event for me, probably. I don't know if I'm going to find myself at another WrestleMania, so I was really oh. trying to soak it up. You miss uh, the informal EJ Pipilotti, Andrew Perloff, how do we get out to Minnesota next year? Movie <laughs> oh, yeah. Yesterday. Road tripping? Another road trip we actually, through Chicago? We planned a budget 
uh, for Minnesota, right? Was the uh, let me know Bogus has got a hundred thousand dollars sitting around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he could wire you a hundred k. We found that out last segment. Yeah, uh, we actually came up with a plan, and it's kind of involved. It involves us getting hit by chairs at some point. Oh wow! So I think we have On to take it the next or because they hear your sports opinions. And- well, I mean, listen, we don't have a budget for this, but if you're going to get thrown through a table, maybe WWE incorporates this into the event. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did I'm gonna get thrown into a table? Kinda. I think I think we need that. Oh, you know, because no. I'm the Bills fan here. Well, uh, you know, we saw Jay Cargill throwing people around, and we thought perfect jobber, Maggie Gray. Wait a minute. So you guys had a production meeting essentially where you volunteered me to get thrown through a table. Yes. <laughs> Was it on lit on fire? No, it didn't have to be on fire. It didn't okay. have to be on fire. Oh wow, thanks. But you know, because that's a little dangerous, and it's PG product now, so I don't know if they'll even allow that. But <laughs> yes, the fire is the dangerous part. The falling through the table, there's nothing to see there. Just like in women's basketball now, there are so many women stars in the WWE. I feel like we could find a good matchup for you. It could be the man, Becky Lynch. I mentioned a Jay Cargill who debuted her first WrestleMania, maybe a Bianca Belair. But uh Belair Gray. I, I see I see it. I see <laughs> oh, it yeah. on, on the on the marquee. Mm. And yes, watching me experience WrestleMania, you made me that made you think I wanted more of that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> It was a great it was a great event. It really was. It was a once in a lifetime and it's been all anyone's talked to me about since it happened. So. Same thing here. And thank God I wore the mask cuz you know. <laughs> wasn't 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 all that wasn't yeah. necessarily the 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 greatest fit on the on the uh single. Let's just yeah. say that. For both of us, EJ. 855-212-4CBS. Okay, lots happening here including a uh, new head coach introduced to the new fan base. Get to that next. Maggie and Perloff across the country. CBS Sports Radio. You're in a 5-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining.
1010. On WFAN. WFAN FM. This is Pearl Off. Let me just do this one. Perloff, Tom Petty. Perloff, are you looking for something else to watch? A new sport, perhaps? Sure. Maybe you're done with golf or college basketball. Maybe you're saying, ah, no more NFL for me, college football. You want something new. What do you got? I've got the Pro League Network with a new portfolio of niche and emerging sports. Would you like to know what some of these new sports are? Sure. Okay. This is mini golf. And slap fighting, which you can now bet on, and oh. also something they're calling car jitsu. Car jujitsu. From what I can tell, this is two grown men in a car, one person in the driver's seat, one person behind him in the back seat. The driver has a seatbelt on. And the dude in the back is basically trying to strangle him with the seatbelt, and he's trying to get out. They're calling it car jujitsu. Wait, um, and how how do you score it? If you get out of the car, you win that round? I guess so. Mm. And you can bet on this, all of this. They're also teaming up with, I sound like I'm reading an ad for them. I was just thought this is ridiculous. Kevin Garnett has a three-on-three basketball league that they now are pairing with this company. But car jujitsu. Honestly, I think the slap fighting is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my entire I life. The car jujitsu, though, might uh, might be interesting. I thought Dana White owns the slap fighting league. You right? can't own slap fighting. Apparently, you, there's a rival slap fighting. Oh, it's not the big slap fighting league. It's, it's a, a different uh, slap fighting. You sure about that? Uh, that's what I'm seeing. Oh wow, um, yeah, that's and you can bet on all of this. Yeah, look. But at how it. do you trust the car jitsu guys? How do you know they're not throwing <laughs> it? They're not taking a dive. Uh, you got to just have your faith in the in the system, in the process, and that this is going to be competitive. Uh, they spent time on a lot of the safety side, they said. They've perfected all the rules with car jujitsu, and there's a sanctioning body. Uh, pass outs with a seatbelt choke is uh, one part of the car jujitsu. Oh, my God. <laughs> and this is televised? Um, mm, car jitsu of one of the biggest events in the history of the sport. Well, that's not going to be hard. When UFC fighters Mark Coleman and Randy Couture will commentate live from a studio in Atlanta. So, yes. Wow. There you go. <laughs> Car jitsu. Gosh, we are scraping the bottom of the barrel here. Uh -huh. I mean, where do we go from car jitsu? Why is slap fighting allowed? I feel like this is like a one-on-one -on -one for the concussion CTE yeah. community to be like, this cannot be allowed. Because I watch these clips and these guys get like knocked out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why is boxing allowed if you think about it? No, I mean, I agree. But you would think Similar. that something so small and so, like, such a nothing sport could be, like, you know, Thanos snapped out of existence in a millisecond because of the safety issues. Well, listen, I mean, the slap fighting, like, at least with boxing, they call it the sweet science. There is an athleticism to this. This is a – you have to train. You have to be so skilled to actually get in a boxing ring. This is just two dudes slapping each other across the face. Right. In boxing, or women. In boxing, you're trying not to get hit. That's right. also part of the sport Defense. is to actually avoid getting hit. Yeah. And here, the rules are you have to take a slap without any kind of defense for it and stand upright. <laughs> it just seems very barbaric. Well, the other part, too, about the slap fighting, if we're just going to go on pure entertainment value, it doesn't go anywhere. It's all the same thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's just, 
you watch people just slap each other. There's never like a surprise ending. There's never like a t- someone taps in. There's no <laughs> strategy. There's nothing to it. It's just slapping. Now the car jitsu, jujitsu in a car, that yeah, maybe <laughs> bogus. You're not into car jujitsu. I'm not into uh, them separately, but certainly not together. <laughs> that saved two his career. Just the the jujitsu part. Yeah. No. No thanks. I'll just watch baseball. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> what I know. Square you are. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, Loser. Do you have headlines for us. Sure. Arkansas men's basketball has a new head coach, but not much else. I'm jacked about another opportunity. Like I'm like, let's go now. I met with the team. There is no team. <laughs> <laughs> so now I got to. Hunter's really extremely confident, but we got to get a roster together. Yeah, I think there's nine Arkansas players in the transfer portal right now. One of them has already gone somewhere else. There's obviously the looming Kentucky contingent, either current players or recruits that could follow Cal to Arkansas. He also suggested yesterday uh, that the NIL setup is more established at Arkansas than at Kentucky, so luring players should be a little bit easier for him and them at Arkansas. That's pretty good. I thought that was maybe a, a, le- a more subtle way than what Deion Sanders did when he got to Colorado. It's like, y'all want to might hit the portal. <laughs> I thought when Cal said, I met with the team, there is no team because I told them all to get in the portal. Oh, no, they were already gone. They were already they there. Were out. Yes. And they even had a kid who transferred from UMass to Arkansas with Coach Musselman, and then he left Arkansas to go to USC with Muss. So they're like, they've had temporary <laughs> Razorbacks. Kid? Yeah. I thought what Coach Cal was doing was lowering expectations here, saying, listen, give me a year to screw around, right? Which uh, I think is fair. Like, it, anyone who expects him to be top five immediately, that seems like a tough assignment. Yeah, but then you're talking about how your NIL situation is such a good place. Then yeah. now the expectations are back on. I, I thought it was very funny when he's addressing the crowd. I don't know if you have this one, but he goes, uh, I just came from Kentucky, which is the bluest of blue bloods. It's like, pause. He's like, and so are you guys. <laughs> you guys are also a blue blood. It's like, don't lie to these people, Cal. So Arkansas listen. is already excited. You don't have to lie to them. They're thrilled you're there. Just, uh, you know, foot off the gas. No one has been a long time since he's been around. He would be the last guy to lay claim to any kind of blue blood situation in Arkansas. Perloff doesn't think that UConn's a blue blood, and they have six national titles, oh. which is Ooh. more than Duke. <laughs> He's hey, what's the deal, basketball the school, maybe. Is, EJ, you follow. Is Reed Shepard going to the NBA? Um, if he goes, he's going to be a top 10 pick. So that's a big one, right? If they can get him to Arkansas, build around him. I would. I, I, I don't know what I would be willing to put on the line. If Reed Shepard transferred from Kentucky to Arkansas, I don't know. I, oh, just, right, I, I, I don't Shepard. know. I, I sing Pig Suey uh, here in the studio. <laughs> the idea that he. That, maybe that, be on key for that one. I know. The, 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 <laughs> Sorry. The Arkansas, wow. I, I, here's what it is. My, I, I've heard it my entire life, so it's fine. I'm terrible at singing. But if that kid, the ultimate Kentucky pride, leaves Kentucky to go to Arkansas, that would, I again, i do whatever you want in terms of celebrating the Razorbacks. Also, he should definitely go to the draft now. Because this draft is going to be a weak draft and be a top yeah. 10 pick and get that money and get started on your next contract rather than next year. Yeah, but can you imagine Reed Shepard trying to g- cover Donovan Mitchell or something? I mean, that guy looks like he's 13 years old. He does not look NBA ready to Yeah, me. but the money's green. Yeah, I think he'll get destroyed right now. He just looks young. Maybe I'm getting old, but he does not look like an NBA player or even <laughs> the defense. It's you acknowledge that. I think defensively, it would be a problem, but he can score. And I think that that would be – he can. Uh, he reminds me a lot of Tyler Hero. But Tyler Hero also looked like a baby, and he came in the league and was getting buckets. Like, I he think really? He's, uh, okay. he's similar. All right. What else we got, Bogues? Uh, a video that Perloff posted yesterday that certainly confirms your oldness. I don't yeah. need to see you hopping back and forth in PT. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you oh, yeah, you could win Perloff, the Masters. <laughs> Perla from his uh, physical therapy. You're looking good. I was, I was trying to be funny about no, I mean, the explosiveness. I would, honestly, I was surprised that you were able to do that already based on what I thought happened to your knee. The skiing accident of t- 2024. <laughs> that we just told him was a torn MCL with no evidence. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, that was an it MCL, was a... ACL, double, double poo-poo platter tear. <laughs> so it was a, I think Pete suggested amputation just to be safe. <laughs> yeah. Just cut it Good off right away. Good thing we didn't go that yeah. route. Yeah. You guys thought the same thing I did. What, you like, got yeah, the MRI back. It said high-grade disruption of the MCL. What does that mean to you? Apparently not that much. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Well, they gave me all sorts of medicines and this gigantic brace that I don't wear, but no, I'm... <laughs> Wait, but now you can play hopscotch. 
Oh, they immediately, uh, this really strong anti-inflammatory. Oh, okay. Yeah, what, what did you think it was? Like vitamins and stuff. I've been listening to a lot of Aaron Rodgers podcasts lately, and so I really got a, my whole idea about wellness has really changed quite a bit from all this Rodgers indoctrinization. No, my doctor put me on the full Nick's plan, which was uh, basically, uh, yeah, I uh, I had everything going for me. I, honestly, it is pretty amazing that I came back. I would say if they want to do a 24-7 on the uh, <laughs> Pearl <Pearl-Oxy, laughs> I think yeah. uh, I think the work I've been putting in the sweat isn't that what young people do now? They do uh, put out videos of anything they achieve. So I, I was pretty proud of this yesterday. Yeah, your hype video. Yeah, my hype video. If you saw it on Instagram, I had the Rocky music underneath. That was even more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think we get a camera crew on you for twenty four seven. Oh, it'll be really exciting. Right? Oh my God, I'd be thrilled. Now, here's Pearl off sitting in traffic. Here's <laughs> picking Pearl up his daughter. Picking up his daughter. Oh, she's got a friend today. That's oh, different. Yeah. I wish there was a camera crew when I, I got to visit the Pearl off compound on Sunday, on, on Saturday. Because you got the OGs, though. You got Carol and Tom. Yeah, if Carol and Tom are there, it's exciting. Yeah, Just that's Andrew, that would have been awesome. And seeing, seeing Pearl off interact with them and, and learning about you know the history of the Pearl offs, it was awesome. That would have been a great episode of Pearl off 24 7. Can we do uh, what <laughs> book report? Best thing you learned about Perloff besides all the comic books in the uh, in the attic? Well, his brother like shook hands with Barack Obama. So yeah, picture, yeah. It's Barack's a picture. part of the Perloff. Yeah, Perloff. Like, oh, yeah, Perloff's and, and the Obamas. <laughs> yeah, like, I, like, I was Collab. like, oh wow, okay, didn't expect to see that when I walked in. <laughs> Um, oh, is yeah, Malia yeah. mean Perloff? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 there's a lot you don't know about the Perloff history, like movers and shakers. I didn't realize you guys were political. <laughs> I have a lot of famous, like, academic relatives, and they all view me as a <laughs> huge failure. <laughs> <laughs> I also have very accomplished in-laws, and I compare myself to the slobbering dog who shows up at the holidays, and just like, who wants to watch the game? I also thought <laughs> They're all I reading thought, The I, New Yorker. I also thought the way... Perloff and my brother were very similar in like how much they put on a cheesesteak. That oh, yeah, also yeah. was oh. very interesting. So to your me. brother caused a gigantic scandal in our house. I didn't want to tell you about it, EJ, because I didn't Uh-oh. want to make you comfortable. My mom almost had a panic attack with your brother's cheesesteak order. Why? Can I read what it was? Oh Hold yeah, on. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. We're all ordering Wait, cheesesteaks. Is there something that's like a no go on it? Like I assume so. Is this well, like putting mayonnaise on a pastrami sandwich? You ordered or a cheesesteak the other day on your way home from WrestleMania. What yeah. did you get on it, Maggie? Uh I did provolone. Because you've taught me that. Yeah. I put uh, lettuce, uh, onion. I put some hot pepper, uh, pickles. So the question was, hey, uh, this is the conversation. Do you guys want peppers and onions on your cheesesteaks? Uh, EJ says, Shamari wants provolone, onion, sweet peppers, green peppers. Not sure if it's do your own condiments, but he does ketchup, mustard, and mayo. What the heck? Whoa. You, you don't put mayo on a cheesesteak. Oh, that's it. Mustard too. And so, mustard sweet okay? peppers, green peppers, ketchup, mustard, and mayo. My mom, she she pulled it off, and it actually looked delicious. Wait, I, you was, put ketchup on yours it. though. You have to put ketchup. Ketchup's the main cheese right. condiment. It is. Of course. It, it, yeah, I'm not a ketchup guy. I've seen people do it. I don't. I yeah, if you get cheese, they give you a bunch of ketchup packets. But mayo <laughs> is radical. By the way, everyone <laughs> thinks it's weird that you have notes on. Uh, EJ's brother's cheesesteak, but it's a text message. It was a text message. Yeah, yeah. you were taking um, pre order Yes. So exactly. does he always order off the menu? Is he that guy? No, well, he, or well, I think, well, so I've talked to him about his cheesesteak order. and He, he lives in Philly, by the way. He, yes, exactly. Yes. And he, the place he goes to, they have a cheesesteak that is the works, and I believe it has all those things. I'm seeing so, in the chat California cheesesteak, lettuce, tomato, and mayo. So somebody's putting mayo yeah, yeah, on yeah, a cheesesteak. Yeah, that steak. makes sense. Although it's not really a cheesesteak, that's more like a salad. I don't even know what that is. But the, uh, <laughs> Okay, but here's the situation. Your friends, pa- we've all had friends' parents, right? Yep. They're buying you a sandwich. <laughs> Don't you keep it simple for the parents? You know how parents are. Oh. Mm. But by the way, and my parents loved me. They liked EJ. They loved your brother. They're like, you think he'll come back <laughs> oh. out again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think it's because your dad thinks he works for the FBI. Yeah, that, that's, that's definitely thing. That's does definitely he? why. No. Oh. <laughs> Unless he's something I don't know. No, yeah, maybe he does. Dip- he can't tell you. They don't ask me about my kids anymore. Like, How's the Stewart family? Their grandkids, you mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, wait, is there any reason to think that your brother works well, for the Well, my FBI? brother works for the government. And, and they're like, A so. mysterious way. And they're like, uh, what, building you got, nice. what building do you go to to go? He's like, well, is this building in Philadelphia? He's like, you know, that's where the FBI is, right? He's like, oh, I just didn't know that. Sure. He's like, is it a three-letter injury, three-letter company you work for or whatever? He's like, yeah. He's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> 
I was like, Mr. Perloff, what are you, what are you saying? <laughs> what are you insinuating? Wow. By the way, it was, it, it was a three-letter cover, but it's it not the one you think. It was no. like GSA. It's, it's, it's a GSA. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. They, they do, you know, but, contracts for So he goes equipment. GSA and my dad I winks at him. Like, likely story. Yeah, yeah, yeah my dad like like actually winks at him like, oh, GSA. He's <laughs> 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 like, we're in the know. <laughs> Your brother was a little bit serious about his job. There was lots of contradictory information there. I think he was confused. He was like, I'm in this different house. I didn't know I was coming here. I mean, that's about my yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, he also he's a big fan of the show, so he's watching you guys for a while, too. So I think yeah. he also was just like, I'm eating cheesesteaks with Andrew Perloff. So it was some of yeah, that, no, no, that no, happy, no. too. Oh, and now oh, your parents yeah, right. are like, a little McLovin are you an FBI agent or are you yeah, not yeah. an FBI agent? Yeah, yeah. When he broke out the British accent out of nowhere, <laughs> that guy's a super spy. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, he disappeared for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> but Came I back, was like, it. nice attic. Like, the oh, half hour, you get up there? Watching EJ explain what pro wrestling, modern pro wrestling is to my dad was an all-time conversation. <laughs> My my dad actually goes so like it's scripted, right? I'm like, Dad, of course it's scripted. What are you doing here? <laughs> and he's like, like, No, we don't call. It. We what did you say? Well, he said it's, it's like fake, right? I'm like, no, we we call, we say it's 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 predetermined. The yes. the the, the, outcome. the outcomes wow. are predetermined. But they, and it, don't but use they, the f word. You don't you use the f word. Wait, has anyone else here ever tried to apply to work for the FBI or the CIA or anything like that? Maybe because I went to college in Washington D.C., right. so this was like a common kind of mm. thing that people would apply. Oh, so people would call you and say, "What's this person like?" Or that, or just like they would recruit sometimes on campus. You know, mm. people who had really good GPAs and worked in whatever, and if you spoke multiple languages and things like that. And my friend. Uh, someone, an acquaintance, really, not actually a friend, an acquaintance went to go apply for a job at the CIA. And so they have you fill out the form, according to the story I heard from this friend, and they ask you, have you ever, like, done drugs? Like, you have to come clean about your past, about everything you've done. And so they have, apparently, according to this person, they have a space for you to write down all the times that you've ever used drugs. <laughs> so the person got to the end and was like, can I have another sheet of paper? And they're like, you can uh, just leave now. <laughs> We're just going to let you know you didn't get the job. If you need like to turn over the back of the paper and keep writing down how many drugs you've done, then you're not going to be CIA yeah, material. Yeah. Oh, that's good. You should have done the, like, you know, when, when leagues do stats, like since 1984, I'm the first <laughs> player to do this. I should have put some kind of year connotation on it. But here's the thing. You're asking people fresh out of college. What yeah. kind of answers are you getting there? But I only, I only did, I've only done these drugs in the modern era, people. Come on. <laughs> but even if you did a lot of drugs, it shouldn't take up that much space unless you're giving the actual instances. Like, she wasn't providing dates, was she? I'm not saying it was a she. Okay. Uh, it was a person, and I, they were trying to rem, like trying to write down, be as accurate as possible. So, like, timelining it, or not just, just like writing it, marijuana, yeah. LSD, or whatever, like... <laughs> 2000 to 2005. Wow. Yeah, no, no, no. It they was were... a Tuesday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it was Tuesday. It Aaron, started Aaron on Rogers Tuesday. walked in. It was weird. <laughs> yeah, I ended up in Costa Rica, the jungle there, <laughs> Rogers and Jordan Poyer. I got to tell you, if you want uh, sweet peppers, green peppers, ketchup, mustard, or mayo, then I don't know if you were uh, maybe smoking something before that order. <laughs> <It> <laughs> no, of course not. FBI I mean, you can't material. Work. Yeah, and yeah. you're supposed to fit in, not stand out. You're supposed to just, like, blend in so nobody notices you, right? Right, So, like, right. you shouldn't order mustard and mayo on a cheesesteak yeah, yeah, in no, Philadelphia. You gotta, oh, I mean, eyebrows. you gotta keep it conservative. Right. <laughs> um, no, no, no. Actually, I think your brother actually eats way more cheesesteaks than we do. He seemed to really know his way around the <laughs> oh, cheesesteak yeah, order. Yeah. He, he, he was hammering it. Yeah, do you, uh, by the way, he lives there, right? Yeah, he lives, yeah, he lives do, there. Do you yeah. visit him and get cheesesteaks every time? Not every time, no. Okay. No, uh, we, I need to do it more, honestly. Because Maggie does, had a Wawa cheesesteak and was terribly disappointed. We need to fix this. Uh, yeah. I know. We need to do a show in Philly. And we need no, to have the I've best. I've had enough Philly in my life for a while. All right? Oh, come on. Wow. You need a Philly good cheesesteak. fine. All right, guys, enough. First of all. It's okay. Yeah, you already you missed the. You guys treat it like it's Paris. It's Philadelphia. You missed the production meeting of how we're getting to Minnesota for next year's WrestleMania. Yeah, I love it. I can't wait to you know break my arm going through a table. If <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. going through a table, look, it's in Orchard Park, New York. It's not going to be in Minnesota. Look, if you have a good worker, they know they don't. you never injure the talent. So I'm sure... Jade Cargill or Becky Lynch. No, will, I trust them. I don't trust you guys. You. <laughs> oh no, we're not throwing you a table. No, it's gonna be it's gonna be someone of that caliber. It's gonna be a champion, maybe Rhea Ripley. They'll if they're great at their jobs, which they are, you won't get hurt. I never volunteered for this. And by the way, mm. that singlet's never seen the light of day. I got a lot of new fans and new friends off of that thing, but I'm not ever aware of that thing ever again. <laughs> Suddenly people around here were very interested in just what I was doing the other afternoon.
Is that back to me now? <laughs> back uh, to you. Sure. Ipe Mizuhara is reportedly close to pleading guilty to federal charges for allegedly stealing millions and millions of Shohei Otani dollars. The former interpreter might have taken more than originally thought, partly because he changed the settings on Otani's account so he never got alerts about transactions. The New York Times and ESPN say federal investigators have only found info supporting Otani's claims that he was just a victim. Jackson Holiday, the great grandson of famed singer Billy Holiday, made his major league <laughs> debut last night. The 20 year old Orioles second baseman went 0 for 4, 2 Ks, an RBI ground out, but Baltimore won at Fenway. 7-5. The Marlins got their second win of the season in their 13th game, 5-2 at Yankee Stadium, and the Padres thumped the Cubs 10-2 in their rubber game in San Diego. The Cleveland Browns and running back Nick Chubb have reportedly uh, redone their contract as Chubb comes back from that major knee injury. His base salary for the coming season drops from $11.8 million to six point two, but Chubb can earn that back through incentives if he is healthy and productive. The top spot in the NBA's Western Conference was up for grabs last night. Jokic has it. Oh, spin move on Gobert. Beat him badly. Left-handed hook shot up and in. 99-90. to Denver leads it by 9. 4.45 to go. Jason Kosminski on Nuggets Radio. Nikola Jokic scored 41. 16 of 20 shooting, mostly over, around, and through Rudy Gobert, who's not Victor Webb and Yama. Uh, the Nuggets broke their tie with the T-Wolves with this 116-107 win. The Mavs clinched the Southwest Division with a 111-92 win in Miami. They're now a game behind the Clippers for the four seed. LA a 124-108 home loss to the Suns. And that Miami loss clinched a playoff spot for the idle Knicks. The Celtics used their day off to sign guard Drew Holiday to a four-year, $135 million extension. Oof. And on ice, the Blues beat Chicago 5-2. Then the Golden Knights lost in Edmonton 5-1. So St. Louis is now three points behind Vegas for the last wildcard spot out west. The Blues have one less game left to play than Vegas does. Guys, back to you. By the way, hockey... Is this the craziest thing that they're moving a team and nobody on earth is I talking about? I forgot to mention that. So there's a contingency. What is going on here? Yeah, for the Arizona Coyotes, maybe having to go to Salt Lake City for next year. So there's apparently two different schedules. Oh, okay. Yeah. I saw they're moving in 11 days to Utah. Well, I, I don't think, I think that was, oh, that's not done. is facetious, but the idea that they have to leave Arizona for Salt Lake is is a thing. Oh, and Salt Lake texted me they'll be there by the 18th. I, I, I saw sarcastic points about that, like how fast they're going to go. Maybe that is true. Is but this they, a stadium issue? Oh, yeah. Mullet Head Arena? Yeah. They're, yeah, they're playing at Arizona State's 5,000 seat arena. Oh, right, right, right. Because like Scottsdale and Glendale have all said no thanks for different reasons uh. to building the Coyotes a stadium. And they got basically evicted from their last building for what? not paying a lease. Yeah, it's a mess. It's, it's, if it was any other league, it would be, I mean, it's like the Oakland A's. To a certain extent. Right. It's just so embarrassing for the business operation of a major league that this team can't find a place to play. Jeez. Thank you for that update. Quickly, John is in Boise, wants to weigh in our cheesesteak debate. John, you have the only condiment that should be put on a cheesesteak is what? Is hot sauce, like green Tabasco, Cholula, something like that. That's the only thing that should go on a cheesesteak. All right, Perloff, you're the Philadelphian around here. Is that right? Uh, I like it, by the way. My wife adds hot sauce to everything. I, I don't think that's traditional, though, John. That does sound delicious, but that's like when you think Philly cheesesteak, that's not what they do in Philly. No, it's not what they do in Philly, but it is delicious, and it's the only way that I can eat a cheesesteak. John, love it. Thanks for chiming in. I'm all for that. I don't get it. What, what's wrong with ketchup? Ketchup's the best. I put the ketchup best. on everything. Oh, see? Yeah. Ketchup is best friends, man. I know. Let it yeah. happen. You, you two and Mahomes. Yeah. I also like putting mayo on stuff. Why my brother can't put a mayo on a cheesesteak? No, I, I I respected that order. I don't <laughs> like the sweet peppers, but you mayo on French fries. Oh, love it. Yeah, I go to Europe just to get mayo on French fries. <laughs> um, <laughs> I jet off to Europe just for the wait, fry. Maggie. You're a hot sauce person. Huge. I mean, I'm from mm. upstate New York. They're putting our baby bottles. Yeah, my wife likes hot sauce and everything. It's really mad if there's no hot. All right, we have to do a cheesesteak trip, people. We need. No, we were just I in Philadelphia. I'm, I'm not going back to Philly. What? I need a break from Philly. There's well, got to be an acceptable, like an acceptable place in the yeah, city. Yeah, there's is there? a place right near here. 
Maggie, just it, I can't live with you not having a good cheesesteak. This is tough. Pass. I'm also upset that you went to Wawa and got the cheesesteak. Yeah, you, know. you, you go to Wawa and was not like, a, solid. like a deli sandwich. It was like the middle of the night, and I was driving home from WrestleMania. It was Eddie Port and Storm. That's a whole other bad decision, though, trying to eat that while driving. It was stupid. <laughs> yeah. Very dumb. Good or bad, just the Back physics roads, of that. that but yeah. Totally pitch black, and I'm trying to shovel the, some kind of cheesesteak. It was I this, stupid. And the image of you eating a cheesesteak on the road is it all stuck in my all my lap. The whole thing. <laughs> just like coming off resume, you're wearing a singlet, by yeah, the way. I was. To just paint the whole picture. <laughs> That's why the singlet's not seen the light of day. <laughs> we should recreate that photo. Maggie with a cheesesteak, ketchup fall or whatever, uh -huh. sauce falling onto your singlet. Listening, Classy. Listening Classy. to Alabama UConn. In the oh. second game of the Final Four. Nothing but class here uh, on the yeah. Aggie and Perloff show. Class, class, class. Thank you, Bogus. 855-212-4227 is the number to call to get involved. You're welcome for that visual. Uh, coming up, lots more to do, including oh, the story we have not gotten to yet. We'll bring it to you next. Maggie and Perloff, CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five-minute break. Okay, ready? This is Pearl. This is Perloff. Join me and Maggie for Maggie and Perloff. Weekday mornings, 6 to 10 on WFAN FM 1019 HD2. I'll do one slower. Perloff. Weekday mornings, 6 to 10 on WFAN FM 1019 HD2. Weekday morning.
This portion of the show is sponsored by the new Hyundai Tucson, available with complimentary class-leading Blue Link Plus. Now it's easy to use your phone to control your Tucson. All right. Seems like the weather is clearing in Augusta, which I am psyched for. Uh, Maggie, do you have the, the pushback times at, in the 10 o'clock hour? From what I can tell, it looks like 1030 is going to be the tee off, and that's what Andrew Bogish gave to us. And then it looks like Tiger is going to probably be a little bit closer to 4 o'clock Eastern uh, than 330. It looks like 354 or so for Tiger Woods. And more important update, how is Scotty Shuffler's wife doing? <laughs> She's crowning. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, so she's due before the end of the month is what yeah. I keep reading. He is a heavy favorite. He went off, I think, about plus 425, between plus 425 and plus 500. So guess what? A favorite has not won the Masters since 2006. The betting favorite. Uh, so this uh, makes me a little bit worried about uh, Scotty's chances here. I just don't want the dude to be leading and have to make this decision. It's too painful. What if he has a three-stroke lead, Maggie? I know we did this yesterday, but I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. you got to finish the Masters. Well, if you go back to his actual quote, he said, if my wife calls me, right. then I'll come. Oh, you think the wife would not call? I think maybe if she sees the leaderboard and she's married to a golfer and this is their life together, maybe she holds off. Maybe she's got her, her sister no. mom there. So she's got her own support system. My wife calls me if she has a hangnail, I got to call. You're telling me that she's going to be giving birth and not call her husband? I don't know. Maybe. That is, it's radical. Women, we keep secrets from you guys. Uh, Big Dave is in Kentucky. Hey, Dave, how are you? Hey, Maggie. So tell me about this Calipari revenge tour. Is, is who's, who's it going to be? Uh, is it going to be against Oakland? Or is it going to be uh, St. Peter's, uh, <laughs> the state of New Jersey, uh, the Peacocks, or is it going to be against UNC Wilmington? Yeah. Because you understand he quit, right? Yeah. No, I know. I, I think that this is the I don't want to say the humbling moments because he's being welcomed into Arkansas with like the red carpet getting rolled out, like he's the second coming. But I think he has to understand, Dave, that if he does want to have any more success as a college basketball coach, he's got to change the the makeup of the team. He's got to hit the portal a little more. He had his opportunity to do that here. He was given every resource that you could possibly have in his position, and he refused to do so. He wasn't even going to make any staff changes. So I know we're the bad guys here. We're the villains. We ran this Hall of Fame coach out of town. But here's the thing. He can still run up and down the sidelines and yell. He can still get beat simultaneously on eighth-grade inbounds plays. <laughs> Same oh. old cow, wish him luck, but I hope he beat his ass. Yeah. yeah, but hey, Dave, by the way, he didn't quit. He was pushed out. I mean, oh, okay, Dave. Yeah. But he clearly, Dave, you know, he went back to Kentucky and said, if you pay me this much, I'll stay. He did not want to leave Kentucky. Does anyone think a Cal probably wants to be in Arkansas and not Kentucky? Uh, no, I think he wanted to stay in Kentucky for sure. I, yeah. I do think that the it, it all is kind of worth it. I think he's right about the new voice. Also, by the way, so some internet rumor updates was uh, Scott Drew was on a plane to Lexington and then subsequently back to Waco. And it was a pretty quick trip, allegedly. Mm. Now, this is all internet stuff, you know. Ooh, I, I love it. I love Were they tracking private planes? Paint Manning style? Tracking the flight. <laughs> yeah, Brett Do we have any Peyton update Manning. from a real estate agent in the area? <laughs> Are they looking <laughs> at schools? If they're looking at schools that it's on. I mean, LeBron looked at schools in suburban Philadelphia, supposedly. And also Miami. And, and that one ended up being true. Yeah. I mean, no, he didn't even. I don't think Sixers was top 10 on his list. Anyway, no, that that's interesting. It is. You say I think it might be a slow burn, though, for Kentucky. It might take a week or two. Well, I don't know. I mean, if they offered it to Scott Drew, I think he's saying yes. So mm. that could either move quickly or if Drew says no, then maybe you're back to the drawing board. Uh, thank you to EJ Stewart. Thank you to Ryan Botcher. Thank you to Andrew Bogish, to Andrew Kaplan, Weedos Coffee Drinkers. You guys were holding it down today in the chat. We will see you tomorrow for a lot more fun. You're in a five-minute break. 